I'm Francis Levy, Edna Sessian, and I are co-directors of the Philip Teddy Center. So we, before we start uh, this afternoon's panel, The Comic Imagination, and by the way, I want to welcome the people downstairs, and there's a lot of them today, uh, I have a few announcements to make. Firstly, uh, I'm going to phrase this differently. The Philip Teddy Center was formally funded by my family's foundation, which was uh, invested in Bernie Madoff. So you can figure out what happened. The math is very easy. You go from a lot to zero. And uh, we uh, got into, it's, it's a strange thing. I, I have mixed feelings about it. No one likes to lose money. But on the other hand, the outpouring of humanity and support has been enormous. People send in small amounts of money. We've gotten some larger contributions. But we really need help. It's, we, and we're, we're struggling to survive on a daily basis. What we, we're, we're attempting to do is get through 2009. If we can get through 2009, then maybe some of our hens will come home to roost. Is it hens that roost? <laughs> <laughs> that something roosts. <laughs> Eggs or hens. I'm not, I've been too involved in neuro, in the neuro area, in the higher brain areas. So what, we, what we're hoping to do, we've applied for many, many grants, and they're hard to get, but we're, we're really, we're doing a very hard, you know, we're working very hard on it. Polly Rosenwake on our staff and Adam Ludwig are especially working very, very hard on it. I'm not going to take any credit on this. <laughs> and, and we have a devoted staff. So um, please, if there's an area of Philip that interests you, we have a poetry program. We have our videography program that allows us to simulcast this and put it all into our past programming. So when you go on our site, you're able to see any Philip program. People all over the world do it. And, and it's all on YouTube also. And there are a lot of hits on some of these programs. Uh, and if there's another, we have a jazz program. Living in the Musical Moment is one of them. And then Jane Ira Bloom has done another jazz program, which has been enormously successful. And and um, so you, you may want to designate any contribution you have for, for, for those programs. And we're, we're having a math program this fall. There's a lot of different things going on. And you look on the site and see what you would like to, uh, where you'd like your money to go to and talk to us about it. Um, the current art exhibit is called On Aggression. It was curated by Hallie Cohn and with the help of Adam Ludwig. And it's, it's attendant upon our On Aggression series. We've done a panel on aggression, uh, which in, in, in honor of the Conrad Lorenz uh, kind of uh, tome, but also we did two others of the psychobiology of war, the politics and psychobiology of war, and the politics and psychobiology of genocide. And we have uh, coming up is the politics and psychobiology of sex and violence on, on April 5th, I believe. So we have other panels in this on aggression series. And this these paintings and uh, the photograph by Alexander Gibbon, for instance, of the Rwanda genocide testimony. These are, the, these are, these are by Alexander Gibbons. And uh, that huge painting is by Margaret Rolicky. All of these have themes either in a kind of abstract, distillated form having to do with aggression, or Robin Tooze's works, which are more figurative. But anyway, what we try to do in our art, in our art series, as many of you know, and I, I may be talking to, you know, uh, to the choir, uh, preaching to the choir, but basically we tried to tie the art in with what we're doing thematically. We have great books for sale afterwards, and uh, the, I've been told by some of the panelists that unless their books are sold, I will be in deep, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, I really want you to buy their books, please. Uh, I'm now pleased to introduce Cody Walker. Cody Walker taught classes in literature and comic theory for many years at the University of Washington, where he received a 2005 Distinguished Teaching Award. In 2007, he was elected Seattle Poet Populist. Interesting. His work appears in the best American poetry, Slate, Parnassus, Shenandoah, Light, and elsewhere. And I'm very jealous of all those attributions. His first poetry collection, Shuffle and Breakdown, a two, uh, his, his first poetry collection, Shuffle and Breakdown, a two-time finalist for the Anthony Heck Poetry Prize, was published uh, in 2008 by the Wayweiser Press. He currently serves as the Amy Clampett Resident Fellow in Lenox, Massachusetts. Cody Walker will moderate this afternoon's panel and introduce our other distinguished guests. I will. Thanks, thank Cody. you. Thank you, Francis. And I want to really thank Francis and Ed, uh, along with everybody else at Phil uh, everyone who's put this panel together, Polly, Adam, Ellen, Mary, Hallie, everybody here. Um, and what a panel. I'm excited. Um, I'm going to start by introducing the panelists, kind of a dream panel. And uh, I think most people probably have the, uh, the sheet that has bios. I will more or less read from them and maybe add a few things. Then I'll say a few very brief words of introduction and uh, offer some questions and see what happens. Um, 
last night I was putting together ideas for this panel and questions, and I ended up with 19 pages of notes, which is really the same as having no pages of notes. 19 pages, no pages. They're equally useless uh, in this context. So anyway, we'll see what happens. Um, Lewis Black on my right. Um, that means that whole piece of shit. <laughs> I'm going to read just a part of just this. Just read a little. I'm serious. Just a little, little piece it's of shit. It's really fucking irritating. Sliver. To, just to start it off. Sliver, you fucking sliver, get a piece of paper. Sliver, really, sliver of shit. So, seriously. It's awfully written. We've cut it down. We've cut it down. No, it's um, ER people <laughs> fucking pumping <laughs> shit into the air. Lewis Black. It is disturbing. May or may not be, according to PR people. <laughs> Here he is. <laughs> He's a comedian, an actor, and an author. Um, he has sold out, according to this sheet in front of me, Carnegie Hall, the Lincoln Center, the Brooke at Brooke, Brooks Atkinson Theater, New York City Center, and MGM Grand in Las Vegas. Uh, was a playwright in residence of the West Bank Cafe's downstairs theater bar. None of this is PR crap. This is, this is yeah, straight up. Yeah, but if you read the rest of the you saw the flowery shit. We, we, we cut shit. it. We yeah, cut it. Yeah, you. exactly. Thank right. So I just want to be sure. So we're good. We're good. OK. Uh, a cast member of The Daily Show since its inception. Uh, he's earned an Emmy as well as a Grammy for his comedy album, The Carnegie Hall Performance. Has filmed two HBO specials, Black on Broadway and Red, White, and Screwed. And has written two best-selling books, Nothing Sacred and Me of Little Faith. Um, I'll add that this morning I was um, eating a bagel and drinking coffee and watching Lewis's um, riff on Chris Crocker's Leave Britney Alone. It's uh, Leave Mike Huckabee Alone. And I was laughing so much, and I was trying to eat my bagel, and I was thinking, this is just not working. So thanks a lot for screwing up my breakfast. Um, next, I'll introduce Jim Holt uh, on, my, on my left over here. Um, Jim is the author of Stop Me If You've Heard This, A History and Philosophy of Jokes. It's a great book. I've read it twice with great attention and uh, great envy. And um, Jim is also a longtime contributor to The New Yorker, where he's written on time, infinity, Einstein, string theory, sainthood, truth, and bullshit. Uh, currently, he just has this little small project uh, that he's working on. It's a book about why the world exists. Uh, <laughs> He, uh, he lives in Greenwich Village. Um, he also, if you, if you Google Jim, as you want to do if you're a moderator of a panel, one of the first hits you find is um, this site that says, who is Jim Holt? And um, it says, is Jim Holt a man or a parasite, a hero or a fraud, a murderer or a messiah? Find out by watching dot, 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 and it turns out we get a description of a play who's... Uh, no, it's, ro a, it's a rock opera. A rock opera. It was, the, the name was suggested by my name, but it's not inspired. By yeah, and, and you have some correspondence that's very charming about why you were perhaps not that Jim Holt. But anyway, you can find that, uh, find that online. Uh, the questions stand. Um, Bruce McCall uh, is on my immediate left right here. And uh, Bruce is a New York artist and writer whose humor appears in The New Yorker, Vanity Fair, and many other leading publications. Uh, next, is it next week that you have the cover of The New Yorker? So look for that, baseball fans especially. Um, he's published three collections, as well as a memoir, and most recently his first children's book, Marvel Town, which is a fantastic book about a robot uprising. And I read it to uh, some young friends of mine uh, to great success recently. Uh, born and raised in Canada, Bruce has had careers in commercial art, automotive journalism and advertising before becoming a full-time freelancer in 1993. Um, thanks to Bruce, I now think of Richard Nixon not as a failed president, but as a failed stand-up comic. And uh, you'll have to read on. All meat looks like South America to get more on that. Um, and finally, uh, to my sort of right, uh, Tammy Sager uh, is a writer for 30 Rock on NBC. Uh, before that, she wrote for Psych on USA, HBO sitcom Lucky Louie, uh, she also wrote and produced uh, for Fox's Mad TV. She's an alum of Second City Main, St uh, main Stage uh, and et cetera theaters in Chicago. She's been featured on Curb Your Enthusiasm, Knocked Up, and This American Life. Um, she performs and teaches classes at the Upright Citizens Brigade, Brigade Theater, or at least performs now at the uh, UCB. And, uh, Tammy is responsible for two of the funniest things I've ever heard on This American Life. Um, one of them we, we may get to today. It's a post-9-11 piece about America calling, uh, calling its allies, and things are a little bit awkward. Um, and uh, the other one is about um, 
about a long delayed joke uh, uh, with uh, Ralph Nader. Uh, and there's also a joke about a frightened child molester. I was wondering if there's some way to get Ralph Nader and the child molester into the same joke, but that's a, that's a challenge uh, for anybody, I suppose. Um, so those are, those are the panelists. And as I said, it's kind of a dream panel for me, thus the 19 pages of questions. Um, I, uh, I had this idea. Today's, I guess, the first day of spring. I, you know, it used to be the 21st. Now suddenly maybe it's the 20th, and even Wikipedia doesn't seem to know. But you know, kind of the first day of spring, and I was thinking I'd come in and I'd talk a little bit about co structural comedy, the, the kind of, uh, North, the, the literary critic Northrop Frye talks about, uh, talks about genres being attached to seasons. Spring is a season of comedy, summer romance, fall tragedy, winter satire, and uh, it's interesting, I, I, I kind of like what Fry says, and then I also started to get really worried and I started to think about something that shows up in Jim's book on, on jokes where um, uh, Gershon Legman um, says that, um, calls people with PhDs fudniks and cockademics. And I didn't want to start as a, as a fudnik or a cockademic, so I'm going to just forget about that for the moment and go right to some questions. But I want to, I want to sort of bring us around to the description of, the, of this panel on the, um, on the sheet that most people have. And it begins with a quote by E.B. White that I take seriously. White says, humor can be dissected as a frog can, but the thing dies in the process, and the innards are discouraging to any but the pure scientific mind. Um, and I, I think that's, that's an important thing to acknowledge um, at the beginning. Um, Philip Larkin, who's a poet I love, also uh, talks about literary criticism this way. He says it has the curious uh, inhibiting effect on one's ability to read literature just as a description of a chair in terms of whizzing molecules would make one afraid to sit down on it. Um, and I, Larkin was also once asked if he consciously used humor to achieve a particular effect or to avoid an opposite emotion, and he answered, oh, no, one uses humor to make people laugh. <laughs> and, and there's a temptation just to, to go to that uh, immediately. Um, there's a book by Ted Cohen. Ted Cohen was a panelist here uh, not, not too long ago. He's a University of Chicago uh, professor of philosophy. He wrote a great book on jokes. And uh, in his book on jokes, he says, only a fool or one who believes in theories would presume to say in general what the purpose of joking is. And I think, well, maybe. But we're not so reticent in talking about you know, music or, uh, or literature uh, or the visual arts. So is joke making really that fragile? Uh, and Cohen himself goes on to propose some purposes for making jokes. He says it offers relief from certain oppressions and helps to attain a kind of intimacy. So the, that's his thesis, more or less. Um, I want to quote from Jim's book, uh, a similar passage, where he says, then there is the feeling that the secret of something as precious as laughter should not be pried into. <laughs> Finally, there is the fear that the, analys the analysis of, am of amusement is likely to be unamusing, or worse, unintentionally amusing. <laughs> as Saul Steinberg observed, trying to define humor is one of the definitions of humor. <laughs> so what to make of that? Here we are. We're, on a, we're going to talk for the next you know, hour and 15 minutes about, about humor. Um, Jim, you wrote a book on it. Um, Lewis, you were on the History Channel, uh, you know, breaking, breaking down, down a joke. Um, Tammy, you've taught, you've taught uh, comedy and improv. Uh, Bruce, you agreed to be here. Uh, so you know, so, so with, with all this, what do we do? How, why, 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 why this nervousness about talking um, uh, why this nervousness when talking about it, and is it is it really that fragile? Let me. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, you say. No, go ahead. You're, you're, you're no, go ahead. All right. What, what what struck me as odd about the whole thing is is laughter itself. I mean, if if, a, if an extraterrestrial scientist came to Earth and started observing us, he would observe us talking and communicating, exchanging information. And every once in a while, we stop and we emit this kind of spasmodic chest heaving, cackling behavior. And where, you know, what is that all about? Where did it come from? Why did people, how did laughter evolve? Is there a biological explanation for it? Does it serve any other, it, you know, uh, Arthur Kessler called it a luxury uh, reflex. It seems completely gratuitous. And so uh, this is what got me into, you know, trying to understand how an intellectual stimulus, like a very subtle joke or something you've written for 30 Rock, 
results in this in this you know grossly you know phys physical reflexive uh, response, and it's um, uh, I mean, weeping is often mystified me for the same reason. I mean these these are two very strange things. And anyway, so um, so I you know in my plodding scientific way thought you know how can I get a look at, at the origins of laughter. And then I, you know, man is the only uh, uh, is the only uh, la laughing animal supposedly. Man is the only animal that has a sense of humor. And someone someone said, well, you know, of course, man is the only uh, animal who who wears clothes, denies himself sex, uh, worships non-existent uh, deities, <laughs> uh, slaves and cheats for his bank account, uh, kills and dies for his country. Man's the only uh, uh, animal that needs a sense of humor. But in fact, <laughs> I'm going on and on now. I, I, I want to get back to your 19 pages of notes. But, but the, the man is not the only animal that laughs. Some of our, our primate cousins, like the uh, chimps and, and bonobos and, uh, and gorillas, uh, laugh. And so uh, I thought, you know, what would be funny to a uh, chimpanzee? <laughs> and, and, and some chimpanzees, of course, have been taught to uh, sign language by uh, uh, one researcher was Roger Fouts. And he, he had a chimp called um, Washoe. One time, Washa was, was riding around on the shoulders of one of the researchers and suddenly uh, urinated all over him. And he, and he did the sign for funny, touched his nose, and snorted. And I thought, you know, this is like sort of an insight into what, you know, in the primeval times, people found funny. And another thing they, they love to do is to mislabel objects. I mean, one uh, uh, a gorilla called um, Coco, which is taught to sign, gave one of the researchers a rock and said, and made the sign for food. And this was, you know, screamingly funny to a uh, to a, a gorilla. Uh, it's very much like the, the humor of, of small children. And so, I, it seems to, you know, the, the, I'll, I'll bring this to an end. The the, the 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 core of humor, we always say, you know, some people say it's about you know, lifting sexual repression. That would be Freud. And and then there's the theory that it's about uh, aggression and mocking other people, the superiority theory. But then there's the incongruity theory, the idea that we laugh at these sort of incongruous juxtapositions, like a chimp calling a rock food. Uh, and um, uh, I have more to say on the interesting uh, subject of primate humor, but I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> that, was, um, that was a Bergson point, the incongruity. That wasn't it? The elasticity, I think he says. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, uh, yeah, yeah. I, just, I knew someone was going to bring up Bergson. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. 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 Thank in different places, you're considered funny or not. I mean, going to uh, going to a new job, you, it's always a weird testing of the waters, and it's um, it's a little, it's a little bit of an act of faith if people laugh at your jokes or not. And sometimes you can say the same thing in different settings and uh, and, and not get a laugh when you know you deserve one. <laughs> but it, it's a, uh, and I think that that's also it's it. Um, yeah, it's that it's not consistent, even among people from the same culture. Let alone going to somewhere like Iceland, where you know even the way they say hi to each other is so foreign. Like, just uh, I can't connect to those people at all. Uh, yeah, so that to me makes me nervous talking about the theory of it because I don't even know for myself when I where I can go and say the same thing and necessarily be funny. Right. Yeah, I don't really think about it. I don't. I, I'm serious. We have to. We're going to come here. I'm like, oh, fuck. We got to talk about this <laughs> because um, I've never thought about it from the first time I was funny. It was just instinctive, um, and so I mean, the only thing that I know of it that was rock solid for, for me was that uh, someone years ago said, and I think this goes to explain what what that guttural response is, is uh, <coughs> la uh, what laughter is based on is tension release. It's the release of tension, quite simply, uh, really simply. So you can call it sexual, you can call it whatever, whatever baggage you're carrying around that day. But essentially that's what, which, what a comic does in a room. You raise the tension and then you pull the string. And it, um, and I and I and I still don't. I'm serious. I was told it. I understand it viscerally. I can't explain it at all. I have no. Uh, I just know how to do it. Right. I mean, that's <laughs> that's basically Freud's idea that there's some buildup of nervous energy that gets released in something, and it might be laughter, it might be tears, it might based be based on his use of blow. 
I think. <laughs> I've dismissed, oh, was I have completely yeah. dismissed It was legal back then. Yeah, but I dismissed his. Yeah, he did way too much blow for me to pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you know, Freud also said that the most uh, uh, fecund sources of, uh, of uh, jokes were um, neurotics. Right. Because neurotics have all of these sort of Im improper impulses sort of seething in their unconscious. So do you, are, you think you're more neurotic than the average guy? Or, uh... No, that's uh, the weird part. I really don't. Really well adjusted? Yeah. <laughs> it's that push. But no, considering for, com for, comic for comics and the people I deal with and for being someone who came out of theater where they're really rampant. Um, because in the theater community, I felt like a caretaker. Uh, so I do feel like they're, I'm, I'm kind of normal for a comedian. I'm not. And that's pretty bad. I mean, back, back in the, we were sitting back in the room, the three of us were having a nice normal conversation, and Lewis was chewing his gum and, you know, and poking at his cell phone. To chew. I could taste your spearmint gum. You were chewing it so hard. Well, but, because uh, I couldn't smoke in there. Okay. <laughs> it's pretty simple. <laughs> My question related to what you said is why are shrinks so unfunny? There's not an analyst who's got a sense of humor. My Ooh, and right? yet they're supposed to be yeah. fighting words here. <laughs> 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 the New York Psychoanalytic Institute. <laughs> I've never met one who did. And my yeah, wife yeah. won. And <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> but that raises another question, which is not just what is humor, but who needs humor the most. I find right. that really interesting. Sweden doesn't have any nightclub comics. Mm -hmm. uh, Switzerland hasn't produced too many comedians. <laughs> seems to me that there's a... <laughs> Things are good is the idea. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, okay, a, the, the, it seems to me, I, from my sociological studies, which are deep and wide, widespread, <laughs> um, there's oppressed people tend to be funny. The Jews, uh -huh. the Irish, and I'm a Canadian, the Canadians. Are right, funny. right. <laughs> yeah. Question, question eight here. Yeah, Canadians <laughs> Canadians are, are in a constant state of being overwhelmed by this giant next door. They have no identity culturally. They feel really pissed about it. And they're one sub they don't have any power, so the, the subversive humor is how, look at all the Canadian comedians there are. Right. And, mm. and, yeah, <laughs> anywhere you find Yeah, right, right. And you name your uh, yeah. Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I mean, there's a joke yeah. right there. And... <laughs> you may think so. <laughs> Regina. Huh? The, the ultimate Canadian dilemma is summed up in the idea that the guy who wrote Canadian National Anthem moved to the United States. Uh -huh. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Well, I mean, let, let's stick with this idea for a moment. There's well, I this, do yeah, something because of what you do. I, um, about, about cultures and, and comedy and stuff, I, I, I taught uh, stand-up comedy to the Dutch. <laughs> um, all, all of them. Well, to, there was a class really at 12, uh, which was enough. And uh, in his... In his and it's described really well once to me is uh, the Dutch are Germans without attitudes. <laughs> and, um, and they really are. And, uh, and, and I don't speak Dutch because right. that's really what that would have been the rest of my life would have been devoted to that. And that would have been all I could do. Uh, but, but I sat, but their major complaint, because I said, uh, uh, was that uh, um, they didn't feel their language was conducive to telling jokes. Which was, you know, the language the, itself. The sound of the language. But it's a, it's mm. a funny sounding language. Like. Dutch sounds yeah. like Dutch. comical German to me. Yeah, so same here. German, and I kept. Exaggerated for comical yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and so I would say, well, then, you know. And I couldn't get them to the point of like, because they got their very f facile for moving to lang language to language. So I said, you know, you, then use an English word if it doesn't. But they never, but, they, but it was really funny that they really, I mean, all of them. Dead, dead set against the fact, and I kept saying, and I, you know, and I couldn't because I don't speak the language, but I couldn't figure out. Well, I was teaching them if, but isn't the thought that you're expressing whether the language follows or not? If the, if they're expressing the, the, a funny thought, doesn't that translate as humorous? Do you really need the language backing it up? English is, I think. A, a, a great language for for comedy because of the the choppy and the sounds and the rhythm and all of that. But the uh, but it was really and it was fascinating because I really did I I got to the point where I didn't understand a word of Dutch but understood. I would sit there and go, "You didn't do that thing where you go." <laughs> 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 you forgot the kiki <laughs> at the end, and because uh, I watched them so much, but I never really learned um, 
about that, that kind of disconnect between their But, lives. I mean, they felt that they were as funny as anybody else inside, and they just didn't... Inside, you know, they felt that... They, I mean, they felt they had a sense of humor. They yeah. really were not sure wow. that they... Because uh, there, no, there was no Dutch stand-up comedy mm -hmm. when I went there. And now there's two. <laughs> Protégés? <Yeah. laughs> I, I lived and performed in Amsterdam yeah. for six months yeah. at, at an English-speaking theater called Boom Chicago. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, it's been there now for 13, 14 years. Yeah. And they, I think they'd be willing to hire Dutch performers, but none have come out. And they, they still teach. But it's interesting. But And I think now, actually, because people are living there longer, uh, Americans, I mean, and so they're learning Dutch. But we would do Dutch as some of the sketches, at everything. But it, it was definitely the effect of a talking dog where, you know, it doesn't matter matter what exactly what we were saying, but they were so happy that we were saying, you know, <laughs> chazelich. Like, chazelich is like their, we sang a song about chazelich, which in, is like some Dutch word that has no translation, but really just means cozy. But like for them, it's it's the, the ethos of, of the country. And uh, they were so thrilled that we were saying chazelich. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was interesting because that was an international crowd that would come, a lot of tourists. And you really, you had to change your, what you would say in order to have a, you would paint with broader strokes, I would say, in order to appeal to more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like that was a very vague <laughs> thing I just went no, into. I mean, the, the sound, I mean, even the sentence sounds are, 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 are funny regardless of whether you've got meaning attached to it. Yeah. Yeah, that, I think that's really interesting. What about this old theory that the, 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 the consonant K is particularly funny? Yeah, there was yeah. a, a comedian who said, I, she, she said, I'm always trying to write a joke where the punchline is the word kayak. kayak yeah. That would be the funniest <laughs> possible. Yeah. And I don't, uh, is that, do you too, I mean, you actually write jokes. Do, do, do you have rules of thumb? I mean, no one would, could say why K would be funny, but you just discover empirically that it is, and so you try to load lots of Ks into your jokes. And then I hear that certain numbers are considered funny. The, uh, the number 32, I think uh, someone said was. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Tad Friend wrote about that in, in, yeah, in yeah, New York yeah, yeah. a years ago. Yeah. I, I actually, uh, he interviewed me for that article, and, and not a word uh, appeared, But I, because I'm a math major. My degree is in mathematics. And so I think he was hopeful that I would have some. Oh, well, you're a funny woman who also knows mathematics? Uh, you're singular. That's <laughs> yeah. amazing. That's, yeah. uh, I, it, sadly, I remember very little uh, math. That That is definitely a skill that has. If you don't, if you don't do anything with math, it will disappear. But when I was at Second City, I did a sketch where we proved that the square root of two is irrational in the sketch. So that was that was a little bit of a thrill. Uh, <laughs> Oh, that's that great. That's sort of the proof is a, re is a reductio ad absurdum. I mean, there's a lot in common. I, 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 I'm, I will sound I facetious, but I'm not. Means. Between <laughs> proofs in mathematics yeah. and jokes, uh, um, uh, proof in mathematics should be as brief as possible. It should have a surprising twist that reinterprets everything. And often you, 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 you do a reductio ad absurdum, like your uh, proof of the irrational What does that mean, reductio ad absurdum? That means you, 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 uh, you start with the opposite of what you want to prove and show oh, that it yeah. leads to an absurd consequence. Yes. Um, yeah. That's what you were doing, and you didn't even know it. No, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> the K word, I think, I mean, I think the K has to do with uh, being someone who uses th that word a, a lot. I mean, a word, I use the word fuck a lot. And, um, and that really... Uh, there's this whole school that believes that you, know, that you can use that word and get laughs. Well, you can't. Okay, it doesn't work that way. Or people, there'd be a, a whole school of comics who are just the fuck school of comics. <laughs> um, but as a word, I think the reason it works is because it's it like it's uh, it 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 cuts through. It's it just it it's like a it's it, it's tension release. It's like you're punching somebody when you use that word, and it gets. It, I think that's the 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 thing of it. I think. Well, and and also just. You you do you write now? So, uh, I think the next thing you know the closest thing to writing is math, and I'm gonna rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why is that? I don't know. I was really good at math, really? and, and yeah, and uh, to no avail, really to no reason, because um, I can't apply it to anything. But I just think that there's something about it that there, because it's problem solving. 
because a writer essentially, especially in terms of fiction or play, I did playwriting, um, you basically create these problems that you got to work yourself out of. So if you put three characters in and two of them are doing one thing, it's still, it's, it's in a sense kind of a math problem. Does that, does that make sense, you know? I was always horrible at math. I hate to think what that means about being a writer. <laughs> uh, I mean, I just think you, I just, I mean, you know, you're lucky you skipped that step, I'll tell you. I always thought it was deductive and intuitive, that it's, the brains are deductive and humorous are intuitive, that it's all, I just go by my instincts. I don't try to reason anything out. But, you, but you're still, I mean, if you're, you know, but if you're writing a piece of fiction, I think you're, you're solving a problem. You set up certain that's things. That's true. For, yeah. And that's, to me, the problem solving aspect of it is the closest thing I know is math. Mm -hmm. Is, I, there are, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I would say there are jokes about, uh, there are mathematics jokes as well. Yeah. One, one that I actually uh, devised my, in my spare time uh, is uh, how many mathematicians does it take to screw in a light bulb? And the answer is one, who then hands it to seven lesbians, thereby reducing it to a previously solved problem. <laughs> The first public airing of that show. That's <laughs> not a bad reaction. Need more K's. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, let me, I want to come back to a couple of things that have been said, and um, and we'll K is one of them. But before that, this idea of comedy coming from tension and release, and uh, which uh, we're going to maybe talk a little bit about. Uh, some of the traditional theories of, um, of why things are funny. Jim alluded to them earlier, uh, superiority, incongruity, relief, and, and this idea that um, what Freud called the tendenti tendentious joke, the joke that uh, is rooted in uh, hostility or uh, sexuality. And, um, and, and the idea is that, well, I think what his idea was that people who are most repressed or kind of batting those feelings down should laugh the hardest when they're when suddenly they're you know they're out there they're expressed and and Jim I think you talk about this in your book that doesn't turn out to be the case right yeah yeah but, it's the most repressed people don't laugh yeah. the hardest I mean according to Freud's theory you're using all the psychic energy yes. to bottle up these sort of terrible impulses you know Freud thought we were going to sleep with our mother and kill our father but you know we all have improper impulses and we bottle them up because otherwise nice bourgeois life would be impossible. And the joke gives you a little holiday uh, from that. The punchline, there's something, I'm sorry, in the setup, there's something clever that beguiles the inner sensor and gets the forbidden material past the inner sensor. And then once it's out there, all this energy you've been using to bottle up the, uh, the, the improper impulses is released. And so what happens? It gets dissipated in this sort of cackling, chest heaving, spasmodic laughter. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, this theory has been pretty much empirically uh, falsified because it's the people who are the most filthy-minded and corruptive that laugh the funniest at, uh, at dirty jokes. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, I, I was, uh, I think, a very good example of this. And this is a joke that, that is, um, it mixes uh, uh, release theory with incongruity. This was told to me when I was a uh, teacher at a, a Catholic girls' uh, a private school in the Upper East Side a uh, couple of decades ago. And this angelic little girl came up to me and said, um, uh, Mr. Holt, what's better than roses on a piano? I said, I don't know. She said, tulips on an organ. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought she gets credit for the, the sheer wordplay was so brilliant. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, uh, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> sort of goes to my other follow-up question. Uh, Okay, but he's the one who's saying fuck all oh, the that's, time. Oh, that's what I mean, I'm coming on. to. That's what I'm going to say, yeah. <laughs> you said we could work blue. It's question four. At the George Carlin tribute, Lewis was trying not to say fuck. Uh, and I quote, if I said that word, the tenuous fabric that holds our society together would be ripped asunder. Uh, and so why? The taboo words that, yeah, there, is, there should not be a fuck school of comics, and, and yet they have a place. Uh, why? Why, why? Why are these in some ways essential tools. <coughs> and we can go back to the, the idea well, of the cave, the aggression. I mean, it's amazing uh, that there's still tools. I mean, that we're still at that point in time. I'm just astonished that we're still at that point in time that, where that, we that can't the words are taboo at all. It's like fucking unbelievable. <laughs> it really is, and sad. Um, but it really... Um, uh, Helps me, it helps my income because I'm like some sort of a, ooh, he's going to go out there and he's going to say that. Right. Well, like it's something, and then, and I mean, look, what was absurd was is I'm at the, uh, the reason I, I said that I'm at the um, 
George Carlin benefit this this thing honoring him and uh, what occurred was is I'm backstage and uh, Dennis Leary is introducing the seven words you can't say on top <coughs> that, that's really a classic piece of comedy and they uh, uh, they bleeped it in the hall in the Kennedy Center now we were you know which I just found beyond my comprehension because we're you're watching the guy do his stuff now the uh, and I did not I had no idea what was going on which was probably a good thing because it was uh, I thought it was the Kennedy Center at fault so that certainly continued to f fill my rage and uh, but it turned out the producers made this choice which was I mean just nonsense and kind of like <laughs> Marana, it's like high school. It, it, it always, it still seems like high school to me. I mean, I snuck around high school doing things like, <laughs> you know, those little things you do something kind of like off color, and it's, <laughs> and I still fucking feel like it's like that. You know, at what age do I get where this bullshit stops? I just wrote an intro to a book, which was one of the great moments of my life. The, the Oxford University Press is publishing a book called The F Word. It's their second publication of the book. It's a spectacular book. It's hundreds of pages of these definitions of the use of the word fuck in manners I had never thought of. <laughs> and, but just to be able to write about the, how great that word is, because it is the word in the sense that it, it's so incredible that we, we are not, that, you know, you, when, I, I just, I didn't, you, you, you know, when you were, you know, the, the, the Jews were not allowed to, you know, they weren't supposed to use the word Yahweh. And it's like, it's like the, uh, the mirror reflection of that, you know, I mean, in a sense, that, that you're not supposed to use this bad word. It's really... But Lewis, isn't there something like that? Words may not have the kind of uh, sacredness now, like words like fuck and shit, all these kind of words that George Carlin, Lenny Bruce got arrested for and so forth. But subjects still have, I mean, it's, it's some, like, there's certain, like after 9-11, people did not make 9-11 jokes. Now, if you have a play like The Producers, where you have two, you have, you have basically the equivalent of a Ponzi scheme, <laughs> and, you, and you have the Holocaust. Is right. it, that, that is a wildly successful play. Aunt Dan and Lemon then plays around with some, some, some themes that are, you know, the Wally Shawn. But the, what, what, the, the, there are certain times in which humor falls completely flat when it hits upon a really, a truly forbidden subject. Uh, you know, I, I, I find myself kind of, kind of the, the whole subject of the Holocaust, for instance, is not cannot be made a, a theme of humor, generally. And people they are in agreement about this, but on the other hand, you have, you have the producers, you have Wally Shawn doing it. There, what, are the, what are the times in which the forbidden can be, the painful can be turned into humor? Peter Barnes apparently wrote, the one, he's written a number of plays, uh, a, a, a British writer, and he wrote a Holocaust play that's supposed to be funny. And I can't fucking find it. <laughs> But it's supposed to be out there. I've heard it from so many people, and I'm, I've always wondered what it was like. Martin you know. Amos's uh, novel *Time Zero*, which uh, is told backwards in time, is hilariously funny. It ends up in Auschwitz uh, with the smoke coming out of the air into the into the uh, chimneys and being reconstituted as as uh, Jews. Uh, but it's a very very funny novel. Italian Bernini did that. Life is beautiful. About the oh yeah, yeah. So that got oh. told. That was a tremendously controversial. Many I know, I know. Right. It was disgusting. Art Spiegelman wouldn't do the poster Art for it. They asked him to do it. Absolutely, yeah. that was the whole thing about that. Yeah. I wrote a piece called Passive Resistance, and I got into a tremendous amount of trouble for it. It was a series of letters of people who had been pleading with Hitler to be excused from the Holocaust because they didn't look Jewish. Yeah. And people really, I mean, editors went. I mean, I really got into a lot of trouble for that. <coughs> Uh, and, and, and still is a subject I bring up in my analysis, you know, why this offended so many people. <laughs> Jim, Jim quotes Sarah Silverman in his book, uh, the Holocaust isn't always funny, uh, you know, which maybe you can only get away with if you're Jewish saying that joke, I, I would think. I think so, yeah. yeah. I think that the, um, a very a touchy subject for humor is the uh, charge brought against the Jews that they killed God, that they killed Jesus, uh, uh, and the charge of deicide. And the first person who, who I, that I know who broke that taboo was Lenny Bruce. He said something like, yeah, yeah, we did it. The Jews did it. We killed yeah, him. Right, right. And if he comes back, we'll kill him again. And I'm like, And this has been taken. And then Sarah Silverman just said, you know, I always heard the blacks did it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> and then uh, uh, Leon Rieseltier, yes, a great uh, Leon Rieseltier, the longtime literary editor of the New Republic, and a funny man, not just because his hair looks like a fright wig. Uh, he he, you know, said, you know, what's the big deal? We only killed him for a few days. Right, right. <laughs> I really made a great show. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because I, I feel that's blasphemous. I, I it, it scares me. Uh, and I, and I, I mentioned that to a friend of his, and he says, yeah, Lee, Leon calls a good Friday, excellent Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let me. I want to. I want to get back to politics and what's out of bounds and if oh, indeed. Wait, just one second, yeah. because I can guarantee, though, words words have an, an inordinate amount of power. Because I can guarantee that um, when if I had if I use use certain words at the congressional correspondence center that I was at, the I can guarantee that half the room. At the what center? You the at? congressional correspondence dinner. Uh -huh. If I had used certain words there. I, half the people in that room would be, you would feel shock in the room. But isn't that wonderful? Well, I think it's, uh, I think it's appalling. Because they're an immature group of idiots. <laughs> you said something bad? Really? I, I just, I, I really, I find it, it's, there were, I've said it time and again, there are words to ex that adults in the community use to express frustration, outrage, and rage. But it's like in Russia, where you, you, you had all poetry. You, you know, it, 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 when it was repression, you had the, the ten, you had Mandelstam, you had the great poets, and then all of a sudden now you have Russia today. People are, are refrigerators and which 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 conglomerate they can get involved with, or, or stay out of, you know. But I mean, in other words, in, in, in repression forms it has a function artistically. It's sad. I mean, the, life isn't fair, but it's, it, 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 society is. I thought that's why I had my mother. <laughs> <laughs> that was better than anybody in the room gave me. <laughs> Seriously. But I thought you liked your mother. Seriously. No, but it, 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 I think that's where it goes to who is the audience, you know? And, yeah. and you're in a, a, I, I don't give a shit. The, but, in, <laughs> but in terms of who gives you the laughter, yeah. you know? Yeah. And there's a lot of, like, mothers here, right? Yeah, well, I'm tough. Yeah. <laughs> no, the, <laughs> mothers without humor. <laughs> but, uh... I, and I think the same goes... My mother would have laughed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm giving you the laugh in, in retrospect. <laughs> as, as a, um, in terms of Holocaust humor or, or Jew humor, or I think it really it depends. My family were Israeli, and the, the jokes that we would tell, you know, I couldn't tell other places. And I learned this the hard way when I was nine years old at a summer camp, and it was it was just a day camp, and I was... Uh, this kid from the south side of Chicago, and it was all these, I'd never encountered a Jewish American princess before, and I was surrounded by them. And uh, we went, there was a trampoline, and somebody would be jumping on the trampoline, and there was this clapping song, and everybody would tell a joke, and they told one Jap joke after another. With uh, and, and so I told my family's favorite joke, which is, why do Jews have such big noses? And the silence. <laughs> the silence. No, wait. <laughs> We're all, and, and I didn't know. And then I was like, well, once they hear the punchline, that will be great. And it's because air is free. And, <laughs> and I was not spoken to for two or three days. It was uh, and finally, by, by like, the way, by the way, I can introduce you to a few dethroned Jewish American princes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think, it, but again, like in my household, where we all knew we're so secure in our Jewish identity, you know. And and now I work in a room; it's the least Jewish comedy room I've ever been in in my life. Um, very waspy. I never knew wasps could be so funny, really? but. Uh, <laughs> You know, it, the, the, also what you can say in a room full of comedy writers is terrifying. It's fabulous. It's, it, it's <laughs> thrilling. It's thrilling. But it really, it, I think it is, you were saying Holocaust jokes can be, you were saying uh, back in the green room, Holocaust jokes can be told among Jews and Germans nostalgic for the Third Reich. It's hard to have that middle ground. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that the jokes that we laugh at in a comedy room are... You know, I feel like racists and rapists would be comfortable with them, and comedy writers, and the, the middle ground would be hard to find. <laughs> I, mean, I, 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 went, I went to the Upright Citizens Brigade uh, theater last night, and um, which, where Tammy works uh, and uh, performs, and the, the jokes that got the, 
the biggest laughs were, were those difficult jokes, those ones that went into kind of dark places. Um, there was one about, oh, there was a kind of a gang leader, and it was the rapist and murderers gang, and there was some, <laughs> some sense that maybe not everybody was pulling his or her weight within that group, and some people were just raping and just murdering, and they were really rapist and murderer, you know, that was a gang, so you can't specialize, and, and you, know, there, there, you know, there's... You can you can object to that joke, and and yet that got you know the, that got the biggest you call it relief of tension whatever, but it's you know w when they went dark is when the biggest laugh happened, and, um, and and let me let me come back to something about that you said, Lewis, that this you, you wish everyone could just say fuck and it was fine because I mean do you really think that because isn't there something. You know, you, you have these taboos and you can break them, and there's the pleasure of transgression, and you get. I mean, that may sound like a, like a kind of academic on, you know, way of. I'd like to move on to the next taboo. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm serious. Yeah. I think there are probably other taboos out there. I well, think. You, I think it's. Uh, I'm not really sure that repression in the end is a good in and of itself, and I'm not really sure that uh, um, that you might that, the, that there are ways in which we grow once we get rid of like silliness. Okay. I mean, seriously, I I I'm, I just feel, um, you know, especially. It's like when I went to Europe the first time, and uh, and I'm not saying you know, but but I'm like I'm fine. I literally am standing in front of a poster of a a, a woman who's like three quarters naked. Like in sh I'm 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 in shock. Like standing and staring, like I'm nine. Like and just kind of stunned that there's a, a maturity in, on certain levels there that we just completely, that we have these arbitrary, and they're ancient rules to me at this point. But it's great, you've consecrated the woman by, by, by your leering. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean what, what, natural loving sex is a horrible thing, basically, because I mean, if, if we just took it as a part of like brushing our teeth and all that, it would be a horrible, I mean, to make it fetishistic and, and sick and hiding and secrecy, it just is a wonderful, it's naturally selective, it makes sex important. <laughs> John Waters said that he, <laughs> John Waters said he was glad that he was raised Catholic because sex would always be dirty. <laughs> He's my man. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I mean, wonder if there's something like that. I mean, you're glad. I mean, there, one of my favorite jokes is Ring Lardner's "Shut up," he explained, and then <laughs> e e Evelyn, e Evelyn Waugh trumped it with "Fuck you," he explained. And I'm glad there was the "fuck you" to trump the "shut up." I mean, yeah. it, there, we need some place to go, I suppose. Um, one of my favorite jokes in your book was. Um, how many neocons does it take to screw in a light bulb? Uh, the answer is go fuck yourself. And I, <laughs> <laughs> People are forgetting the background of the already because Dick Cheney is receding into Yeah, you, know, yeah, you have God, to picture yeah. him in the wheelchair and the black hat, and he's sort of saying it over his shoulder as he wheels away. It's, it's still there. A few, few more months anyway. Um, anyway, you know, let's. People were talking about politics. I, I had questions about I mean, Obama. Bad for comedy? Yeah, he's got yeah. dignity and steadiness and mature. There's nothing ludicrous about the man that we discovered yet. I mean, look. Well, that's what I wonder. Will Clinton he ever seem funny? Incredible. He was like the, a bright man with these sort of incredible Rablazian yes. appetites and weird sexual tastes for fat trailer trash women, and you know, and it was a and 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 Bush just a you know a typical clown or a comic butt who was also right. uh, could be very sinister and dangerous. And now Obama, you know, he taught constitutional law at the University of Chicago Law School. And that's 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 not anywhere near anything that's humorous. That's, I mean, that's, I mean, that's uh, what I wonder. The, I mean, the, the, the funniest thing I've seen on Saturday Night Live about Obama has basically been Fred Armisen's little kind of commercial, I keep it cool. And that's, I mean, that that's how, that's your spoof, how cool he is. That's, you know, that's not quite... That everyone is, you know, I was uh, talking with an Italian journalist woman at uh, uh, Repubblica the other day, and Obama oh. came up, and yeah. she said, you know, cool. He, you know, to all of us, he's cool. And right. they, they, the word o repeated over and over, a mantra. And, you know, throughout Europe, this is the, you know, Obama is the icon of coolness. But, you know, the problem, the only good uh, uh, joke I heard about Obama during the campaign, which is more a joke at the expense of the... Um, uh, right wing, uh, the, sort of the Fox uh, uh, machine, was, uh, have you heard Obama fathered two black children? Uh, <laughs> right, yeah, is, uh, that's the only thing I've heard funny yeah, about. Right. You know? <laughs> I did hear that, yeah. I mean, even if he, he, I mean, he seems almost gaff-free. If he makes, he made, I guess he made a gaff, people say, on the Jay Leno show. <coughs>
and he yeah, said he right. bowled like a Special Olympics participant. And immediately he's correcting that gaffe even before it goes on the air. I mean, he's, a, he's sort of that he's so perfect, in control you know, that, of his image. Yesterday, the, she was talking about the, the, the organic garden, you know, and sort of the, I mean, the perfection could be the subject of, you know, yeah, Camelot. I think, I think, yeah, yeah, I think coolness maybe. itself could be funny. Right. Right. You have to take right. it to its right. extreme. extreme. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, I but mean, that's, so, that's so, I mean, that doesn't seem to offer as much as Clinton being a horn dog or no. Bush being an idiot or <laughs> it's, only, it's only been a couple of months. He hasn't, he hasn't built up a, a, a collection of... I mean, Bush wasn't royalties. really funny at the beginning. Yeah. If you remember, it was, you know, there's a quality of pain there, but you, <laughs> you don't remember it being funny. Um, I don't think... That's right. I think it's off the point. I, I've, I've been asked... In interviews, the most amazing thing is they ask the question, you know, I know this is a cliched question. That's the way they usually, before they ask the question, which makes my brain go, then why the fuck are you asking the question? <laughs> and the question is, uh, now that Bush is in president, what are you going to do? Right. I mean, I've been asked that. And my first reaction was, well, I guess I'm not going to be funny anymore. <laughs> that's, that's the end of my humor. Uh, I never thought he was key to it. I never thought that Clinton was key to it. I don't think that political humor is keyed on the president. I don't. I think that we live in a country. Bush left office doesn't mean stupidity has left the country. Um, the fact that it's like whack-a-mole. I've begun to, I've, I've, I used to think it was something else, but now I think like you get rid of one and something else is going to pop up. The, the day they're asking me, I've got this fucking idiot asking me the question, and I'm looking online, and, and on the same moment that he's asking me the question, uh, the, the Secretary of the Treasury, Tim, that he picks, is, is, didn't pay his taxes. Are you, well, please, okay? Don't, it does, I don't think the president is as key to our political sensibilities and humor as the rest of the landscape is. What, what Bush allowed to, to be an agenda was the key to the comedy, the political comedy. I mean, the kind of jokes that come out on, the, on like the Leno show and the rest of it, because people say, did you watch the Leno show? I don't watch Jay Leno, okay? You want to go, you want, he wanted me to listen to him, pick another fucking late night show. Um, seriously, I'm not going to, you're going to, he's going to make me turn that show on that I never fucking watch. So, uh, so the, uh, I think that it's a, uh, uh, it, that it's really, um, uh, we, 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 the, the, it's the agenda that comes out of it. I think, I think the key, I mean, I, the, the joke I came out with almost immediately was Obama started talking about hope early on. And I just went right at that. I went, that was my, my I started, I end my act with it now. He just said he's full of hope. His nipples are bursting with it. <laughs> he's actually lactating hope. And I think that's really great if you're under the age of 30. But I'm 60, and as far as I'm concerned, hope has passed my ass by. <laughs> so, so you can always, it, it's, it really is like trying to figure out how, I mean, because I really do admire his intelligence, his wit. I admire the fact that they seem to be a real family. It's the first real family I've seen in a long time. I didn't trust, I don't think the Bush family ever got, I think that, that the tension around that dinner table must have been staggering. <laughs> and, and, that, and the Clintons were just kind of quack, quack, honk, honk, I mean, whatever they were doing. But these, these people actually seem to hang out and enjoy each other. I mean, it's, I, for that alone, it's great. If he does nothing else in office except have a family that's like watching the, the Cleaver family when I was a kid, fucking A, great. Um, but but the but the rest but the thing I think we're going to see with him that I think you're intimidating was it was intimidating was the fact that he he talks all the time. Now I think that's great because we had, haven't been talked to in eight years. I think unconsciously I think he's doing it in order to try to get people to participate. I really hope that's the reason. Because if he keeps talking, I can guarantee it's going to be fucking funny after a while. <laughs> that's true. You are going to get, you are going to get sick of it. You're going to like, shut the fuck up. With you. Please. In terms of, of Clinton uh, and Bush being, I, I worked at Second City during the time of Monica Lewinsky, and that was, it, it, 
that, that, that was almost death for comedy because we would get suggestions and always intern, watch. intern, yeah. like every night. And it, it was just, it's, uh, it's also just an improv that can be the late, when, when you start at prostitute or you start at something like that, it, it gives you very little room to go or go. And it, it was, I don't know that that's necessarily great for comedy to have somebody, or when Cheney shot his friend in the face. Yeah, yeah. Like, where do you go from there? He shot his friend in the face. The guy apologized for having his face being shot. Yeah. There's, there's, and, 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 so when you just don't, admit, you don't have to make a joke, you describe it exactly. and it's very funny. Yeah, when, right. when everybody else in America is saying the exact same thing, yeah. it's, 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 it's hard, you know, when, when the guy, and also, it was a little creepy, like in an audience, a grandfather, you know, you'd see this like grandfather with his grandkids at Second City shouting intern. And it's just like, God, you're just conjuring up blowjobs in front of your grandkids. And it's okay. Like, it's, it was just not, it was, I think it's okay that we have to find a new, a new, I'm, I'm totally fine not having something obvious. Right, right. Jim, you have an intern joke, though. Can you? The Clinton weight joke? Oh, yeah. I mean, this, I've, uh, it's not my joke, but uh, when, uh, uh, you know, about a year or two ago, uh, Clinton's doctor told him that he had to lose weight and to go on a diet. And um, I think this is a Letterman joke, actually. Um, and uh, Letterman said, yeah, the, he, he, the diet was really successful. He's lost so much weight, and now he can see his intern. Uh, <laughs> And I, I told that I told that joke to a yeah, yeah you have to think a little bit. Um, but I, I told that joke to a friend of mine at the Wall Street Journal, uh, works in the editorial page, and he thought it was pretty funny. And so he told it to some of the people who write the editor, editorials of the Wall Street Journal, and none of them got it. And I. I, that's very strange. And maybe you know, maybe that's not an oral sex culture. They don't because they're not. Uh, Anyway, I mean, this is, a, by the way, uh, just to get another joke like this out of the joke book. Um, this, I was talking to a, a right-wing friend who works, uh, for, worked for Buckley at the National Review um, about <laughs> Ralph Reed, who was you know, the um, uh, factotum to uh, Pat Roberts and, and um, uh, now disgraced with uh, Abramoff. But we thought, is Ralph Reed really sincere in, you know, in, in his religious persona? And I told him, and I, I just heard, you know, I like to collect jokes about all religions. And I was looking for a joke about atheists. And the only one I could find was, it's an improper joke, but I thought, why should we feel sorry for the atheist? And the answer is, he has no one to talk to while getting a blowjob. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, would Ralph Reed find this joke funny? We, we thought, and not everyone gets that either. Uh, yeah, I don't get that. Uh, <laughs> No, I've, I've talked to editors in magazines who don't get who are, uh, uh, but I feel bad about, about retelling jokes like this, but it is, you know, it's a little holiday from, for, I'm very repressed, and it's a little holiday for repression for me, a little bit of liberation, and it's all harmless. And I think, you know, laughter is an anti-aphrodisiac. You don't, I mean, it, yeah. you, if you start laughing in bed, your sexual congress is going to go south. Yeah, uh, um, so I think it's all healthy. When that, when that uh, judge, in, um, Judge Kaczynski in, in uh, Los Angeles was presiding over an obscenity trial, and, it, and, and on his family website, it was discovered he had a cache of quote unquote porn. And, and everyone made heavy weather of this. It wasn't porn, it was just body humor. And I think in, in, order, to, in order to find body humor funny, you have to basically be a kind of bourgeois. Uh, you know, moralist, uh, and, and I hope that this is true. Um, this is my moral apology for uh, for body humor, and I'm, I'm obsessed with the idea: is there a joke that's both very, very funny and deeply, deeply immoral? Uh, and this is a um, we like to think that all values ultimately can exist in harmony. You know, Oscar Wilde said, um, <clears throat> "There's no such thing as a moral or, or immoral book. A book is either well written or it is not. That is all." No, is it the same true of jokes? I don't know. I mean, it, you know, sometimes jokes actually can be an, uh, 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 an instrument of oppression. But we like to think that, you know, that if it's funny, there's something subversive of our, you know, our received wisdom, and ultimately it will be salubrious intellectually and morally. And I, I don't know, this is just... I, I mean, like yeah. Twain said, against the assault of laughter, nothing stands. And I mean, there's this idea that we want that to be true, but maybe it's not... Yeah. I mean, I think the, the, the jokes I was making about deicide, or I was quoting about deicide early on, I mean, deicide is an idea that has done tremendous mischief throughout history. I mean, this was a, you know, the, the Catholic Church's rationale for, for persecuting and killing Jews for centuries and centuries. This is, a, this is something that deserves to be mocked. And if it, you know, if it hurts the feelings of, uh, 
of, of some people, you know, too bad. Uh, the, 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 the evil is on their side. And, what about uh, the shock jocks, though, like Howard Stern, you know, uses humiliation of people? Or, I mean, I've, never, I've never seen Howard Stern. Uh, I don't know really anything about him. Yeah, uh, and but then there's I've, the other one, Andrew Dice Clay. Uh, I, uh, Dice used to be on. Uh, the, the, that, that was a different type of humor. I mean, the, 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 there's, there's this forbidden subject matter, this matter that seems that, that humor can be a liberating, can, can liberate discussion can liberate the way one thinks about things and bring out all, but there are these people that, that where it functions on a totally different level. Like there, there was one Howard Stern, I, was, I used to go around New York City and I would go from cab to cab and every cab, you, that's how I listened to Howard Stern because they were going to be on in every single cab oh, right. at that, at, back in the 90s. And there was a woman who, who, des who wanted to get up and take all her clothes off and he wouldn't let her. And, and, and he, he got on the notion that her parents, had, that her mother had committed suicide. And he kept going, and she said, but I just want to take my clothes off. He said, well, what do you mean? Your, your mother committed, how did she commit suicide? And, this was, and people, they were roaring in the studio. And she was actually, I think she fainted on the set. And, and, and that was the, uh, I got out of the cab at that point. But it was, a, <laughs> you know, it was, this is, this was, a, and that's the whole purpose of the show, is it functioning on a certain level. It's like, it's, it, you know. Yeah, but that's like, the, I mean, that sounds like the old, uh, you know, medieval, uh, yes. making, uh, laughing at dwarfs exactly. and, and yeah. handicapped people and bear baby. I, I, I mean, it's just, I, I it's not to, funny. It's just cr it's cruel and, and, yeah. uh, it's, and yeah. coarse and stupid. Well, yeah. Howard Stern, though, I, I, I like Howard Stern a lot. Uh, I, I, I get bored when he talks to strippers or, 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 or does, I mean, there's certain things that he does I just don't enjoy. But then when he, <laughs> when he gets uh, personal, uh, I, I, I find it really interesting. Like when he talks about his, his own, or I, I feel like he's a really great interviewer. And so I, I just automatically react to shock jock because that, I think that again, that gets to who, who is the audience, you know? He's not shocking everybody. That's, or not everybody's laughing for the same reasons. I don't enjoy it when he's talking. I, I didn't enjoy the, the drunk dwarf. It made me sad. Oh, yeah. drunk, drunk, but yeah. I know a lot of people who I respect who really enjoyed that. Like, the, uh, you know, it, it, at Mad TV, there was a character that I hated, that I would turn off the TV when it was on. And then you meet people who you, you know, Respect so much who, who that was their favorite character. So it's like Elizabethan theater where you, 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 you had your you, you had your, your troupe, your troupe of grotesques in the pre pre Shakespeare and Elizabethan theater. This, this troupe, regular troupe of all these grotesque characters, Malvolio, all these varying people who would appear again and again. And, there's a, and that, that's what he has basically. I and mean, he has a troupe of people that were, were repeaters. But he is a. Uh, I mean, I've done I've done the show like three times, and uh, and I do a lot of radio, and his. Uh, the reason I like him, because a lot of the stuff I don't, I have friends who love him, and, uh, um, but he's really, if you're on that, if you're in the room with him, he's a genius. He's a great radio artist. There's no, there's no discussion of that. You may not like what he says, but, to know, but if you know what radio is, I sit there and I will say something and he will do, he, I just watch him work, it's extraordinary. You know, and he, it's, he knows how to work that medium. And there are not a lot of them around. There was a radio guy in Chicago, and Steve I, Dahl, yeah. who was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Steve and Gary, like, grew up, and they're fantastic. Yeah. And they were uh, called shock jocks and were taken off the air all the time. And the FCC regulations are so. Th that's what's crazy to me. You mentioned being in Europe and seeing the naked woman. I remember when I lived in Amsterdam, when I got there, there was a billboard that was, like, national because it was a. a for AIDS uh, education, and it was a white woman naked and a black man with her hand, his hand over her breast with a condom, and it was like from the government telling you to use condoms. Like I am in a new place, and uh, but the FCC that cracks down so hard on sex stuff—it's the amount of violence that is completely. I mean, just what you can see on Twenty Four is. Insane. So it's also what, what what our level of shock is is different. The the sex is shocking, and yet we can see somebody's head being sawed off is is not considered shocking. I think there's the line between shocking and funny is also yeah. to be looked at. Do uh, you remember Michael O'Donoghue who used to work? Yeah. He's a good friend of mine. I couldn't stand what he did. His his first Saturday Night Live thing was the Mormon Tabernacle Choir putting needles in their eyes. That's not funny. That's just you know taking it to the ultimate extreme. The Vietnamese Vietnamese baby book, uh, burned up Vietnamese babies during the lampoon days. He kept pushing it to the frontier and bullied you into thinking that was supposed to be funny. He thought he was the world's greatest 
humorist, and I, I didn't buy that. I couldn't go that far. Yeah. It's not really, it's not witty. It's not creative. It's just sort of how far can you push it? You know? It's it's Second City. Part of the process was putting stuff on stage before the show would open, and we would do stuff. Um, my friend Rich Telrico had this blackout that I thought was great, where he had a little American flag, and he would light it on fire in front of it, and 300 people just watch, and then he. You'd look up and go, oh, don't worry, it, it had AIDS on it. And then it just lights out. And we did it twice. Well, that's witty. And, and then it was like, ah, it doesn't work. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it was, that was an envelope pusher. And yeah. yeah I, I, I no, Andy Kaufman made a, made a whole thing out of that. You know, yeah. And I don't, and there's a bunch of Andy Kaufman stuff that I cannot stand. You know, and I'll sit sometimes at stand-up shows and feel like I've been taken hostage yeah. by the, you know, it's... Yeah, and I just always found him, I found Annie incomprehensible. I just never, it was opaque to me. Yeah. Um, this, uh, but the, uh, well, uh, this is kind of that thing that it, it, sp it ends up spiraling and, and I've, that I've found to be the strangest, th one of the strangest things. I miss is the nappy-headed thing where he kind of talked about the basketball players. It's a terrible thing to say. Um, and yet I know for a fact, pretty much, uh, that that is really, it's like, a, it, you know, when it comes to Howard and it comes to him and it comes to some of these other people, it's like a cave. Three million people, a million people walk into the cave. They're the only ones listening. Nobody else is listening in the cave. Nobody gives a shit about the cave. And the cave is so kind of stinky, people avoid the cave. But what I thought was reprehensible was, and even more so, was the fact that they kept, they, that thing spiraled for three days, and I heard those quotes over and over again on every other, anything you turn up. Yeah. And I'm a said, he called them yada, yada, yada. And I'm a said, he called, it's so terrible. This is so awful that we're going to tell you another 10 times in the next hour. <laughs> That's where it, I think it's completely, there's nuts. Because if they had let it alone, nobody would have known, except the, the million idiots in that cave. So really, how, how do we all feel about scatological humor? That's one of the big, you know, I, I, watch, I still watch Saturday Night Live, and, and when, when, when they're running sort of thin on good material, they resort to, 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 to yeah, fart sketches on down. And I really, that really bothers me. I, I, I don't find them, I love Sarah Silverman, but she relies way too much on that, so I'm, I'm very conflicted about it. And it's certainly not, you know, it's not a moral matter, it's a purely aesthetic matter. It may just be because I got through my anal phase of my psychosexual psycho development uh, without any real kinks. Uh, I don't know. Um, and they're not considered funny in, uh, only by small children in France, for example. Uh, by the way, French children have uh, a, a very, uh, I, I, I was spent a lot of time with a, a French family, and the little boys would tell jokes about the zizi tordu or the twisted penis. And this seemed like way beyond <laughs> what, what uh, you know, the kids of the same age in America were telling. Oh, and one more, one more thing on your observation of the relative openness with which female breasts are displayed in, in France, and, and you know, comparing that with the, uh, the Super Bowl halftime show where Janet Jackson's breast was, was just uh, revealed for a second. I always wonder whether that's why American men are obsessed with women's breasts, and that's not the case at all among French men. They're completely obsessed with legs and the, the nether regions, but breasts do not uh, titillate them particularly. Uh, that wasn't meant to be a pun. Um, <laughs> and uh, and it, that's, such a, that's such a sort of dumb, obvious, psychosocial explanation of it, that, that it, you know, in America, there's something taboo about the public display, the display of breasts. But American men are sort of infantile in their in, in, in their obsession. French men don't like breasts. Because I've talked to millions of them, oh, and they just they can't understand. They, it's comical. You know, it's the, know they they think of us as, as being uh, uh, the, the, the French. Uh, one term uh, that was used: uh, Americans uh, are in the th a grip of a, of a puritanical pornography. You know, on the one hand, we're sort of horribly puritanical, and and, and we're but we're, we're we have an unlimited appetite for porn. Uh, Two good and, together, though. The more puritanical you are, the more looking you're. I'm sorry. Like, the more puritanical, the more you're going to like porn. The more you're going to go to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, apparently, Andrew Sullivan uh, uh, on his website, I keep seeing that uh, all of the visits to porn websites. If you look at the correlation, if you look at visits to porn websites, country by country, 
So the, the greatest frequency is in the, uh, in the, in the uh, Islamic countries, the most repressive Islamic countries. Yeah. And also within the United States, it's in the, the Bible Belt. Yeah. Uh, There's tons yeah. of porn in France, though. And even with Welbeck, one of their fa famous writers, has written a platform, a whole book about yeah, and, you know, but it's that's the pornography. It's it's about ideas and there's Hegel yeah, yeah, and, yeah, it's, yeah. and it's soft core porn. I mean, it's not the, the, no, the well, stuff. No, they have hardcore there. What is very popular in France is the cartoons of porn. Hmm. The what they call bande dessinée. Those are very popular and those are the erotic pornographic. That's where they go the most. Cartoon. Uh, okay. I wonder what the difference is. Why that's more appealing than you should. Uh, that might be something you could explore. But, uh, no, no, oh no. I, <laughs> I'm a Presbyterian Canadian. I don't right. do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you a question, which we've, we've sort of been touching on anyway. It's, it's just this very basic question, and it's going to be different for everybody. But I mean, what what's off limits? And this is a question that gets asked, of course, whenever there's you know, 9/11 is the classic example, but there are others as well. And uh, you know, we can go back to the you know, does comedy indeed equal tragedy plus time? If so, how how much time? Um, the um, Tammy you did a piece on for this American Life pretty soon after 9/11 that um, that I thought worked really well and um, and yet just a few weeks before that Gilbert Gottfried had been at the Friars Club uh, in in New York and tried some 9/11 jokes and I have one written down here. Um, I, I have a flight to California. I can't get a direct flight. They said they have to stop at the Empire State Building first. <laughs> and, you know, you can laugh now, but people did not laugh. They were, uh, you know, too soon. Too yeah, soon. Yeah, too soon is what they said. Too soon, too soon. And then he, you know, famously went to the aristocrats joke, and um, which is a whole other discussion, perhaps. But um, so, you know, what, what, is, what is off limits? I mean, the easy answer is, oh, nothing's off limits, but I don't think that's true. So for, especially for those of you who write and perform, um, how do you wrestle with both internal and external censors? I, I think context is, is, is key, you know, and, and, and that was something at Second City when you put together a review of sketches, a sketch will work at the end that won't work at the beginning or vice versa. And I think it, it depends where you're saying something and who you're saying something in addition to the time factor. And uh, yeah. I, you made me think of what Tita Faye said. <laughs> when the, uh, a reporter asked her when she was writing for Saturday Night Live, is, did they, is, there a, is there a political bias among the SNL writers? And she says, no, no, we have one rule. If it's funny, we run it. And if it's not funny, we run it later in the show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is completely irrelevant, but I wanted to give her credit for that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I actually did a stand-up of, of, for like 13 people, but uh, a week after, or a few, no, two days after 9-11. And uh, you, I ended up doing uh, the stand-up that I was going to do before 9/11, and then I would just alternate it with what I was, you know. Now it's I, was, I would say like this half of the stage is, if it's before 9/11, and this half I'll go over here and talk oh. after 9/11, and I would just A go. Physical over. boundary. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Not that this, but this half yeah. wasn't funny. This half was like, what the fuck? Right, right. And how did I, you know, I heard about this from Rick Dees. I never listened to Rick Dees. In the morning, I don't know if you guys know who this is. Is that right? That's how you heard about my work. Uh, yes, it's well. the worst radio DJ in the world. I mean, he is in the cave and deserves to be. But I mean, he talks about it's like 92 degrees, degrees like not even not even the worst. And I was like, now he will be in my brain forever. Uh, Rick D's, uh, you know. And then I would go to that side and do my always with wings joke. But uh, I. I, I for me, p cutting the stage physically in half was contextualizing it um, that helps. And I think context, you know, when, when people take a quote and blast it all over the place, it can also rob it of its, con uh, give it, a, it gives it a new context that can rob things of their humor. Right. Uh, abortion. It's an exhausting topic to find a joke about. And God knows I've attacked it from every angle. It's not worth it. It's just not even worth it. People have so, so loaded when it comes to that that it's not worth it. I don't know of really the good joke. Of the, there's a comic named Teddy Alejandro, and I can't remember the joke he does. And it's, I think it kind of gets it. It's funny, but it kind of takes it off in another direction. And I, I, that's the one topic I won't even consider.
We're not even allowed to say the word abortion on TV now. Stand. I mean, Maude had one, and yeah. nowadays you just we just can't even say the word. You can't even say the word. No, like standards. There's just, a joke about not saying it in Knocked Up, right? I don't remember. I, I think it, it, they they talk around it a lot, and then yeah. the joke is that they're not saying it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Shmushmorshin. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that was the joke. Is he didn't want to hear the what? word. Yeah. But I found <coughs> I was lucky after 9/11 because I went. Uh, I wanted out of here so fast I couldn't see straight. Not out of fear. I just couldn't take the. I couldn't take the disconnect of watching the TV and going down and looking. I mean, it was just so, it was insane. And I wanted to go back and do what I do. And, uh, With the I, Dutch. <laughs> I went, but I went to San Francisco. I had a gig in San Francisco and I got out as soon as I could. And I, um, and I wish that I had the, the, uh, the tape of what I did because uh, it was, I just, that's all I talked about. And I made jokes about it, but I don't really remember. I don't remember anything I said, pretty much. Um, and they, the response in that room was unbelievable, because, because uh, there was. San Francisco is a different case, though, because San, San Francisco is a city living as if they're they're living ten years ahead of the rest of the country, or maybe five. So that it was literally, I felt when I was performing for them, that 9/11 psychically, on some level, had already occurred there, and they were way down the line. You know, when you've got a city where, you know, you know the the gay where the gay population basically is participate. You know, where all of it's pretty much out in the open. It's a different. So in a lot of ways, it was an easier place to perform, much easier than any other place in the country. But uh, I, went, I was so enraged by, I mean, I went on for 10 minutes about Bush, and I don't know, it was supposed to have been funny, but I can't, I couldn't remember a joke. Because Bush coming here and that whole, the whole thing that became his, like, big deal, the standing there with his little bullhorn that was like his symbol of what, the, the most, uh, to me, the most, it, it, really the most, dis one of the most disgust, uh, the most disgust I've felt in my life was because he'd flown in three days afterwards, and my feeling was, fuck you. You come here now. You get your ass on a plane, and you stand, because to do it three days later, then you're the subject of a joke to me. Then that's funny. And I was, and, and of course I get laughs, because I am, that's where my humor comes from, is anger. But a lot of the times I get angry, and then I don't remember what the fuck I said. <laughs> that's a problem. <laughs> but, um, but the joke that I did do, and I had to stop doing because, it, uh, and I and I thought it was funny, and I know it was, and I know it was true, was I said that everybody that morning um, had that moment when they thought, uh, where they were, they they felt that horror, they felt all of those things, and then had that moment of, oh man, this really fucks up my day. <laughs> And I still think that's funny. Once again, I think you're wrong. <laughs> I believe that's a funny joke, because I think everyone had that moment. I don't think there's anyone in this room who didn't have that moment. I, think, I don't care if it was four hours or six hours later. I think print is slower than television or, or stand-up to get with things. At The New Yorker, after 9-11, I couldn't sell them anything even remotely connected with. Somebody, I'd, I'd sold a painting that summer of an airplane in a blue sky, and oh. the guy sent it back after 9-11, saying his wife couldn't stand looking Airplanes are scary suddenly. It was an airplane in the blue sky. Isn't that amazing? But I, I couldn't sell them a piece of humor about 9-11, even though I think they were the public was leading the editors. They, they are so goddamn conservative. And I finally got a piece in in November, and it was about what you can laugh about now, which was just a series of innocent, crummy little jokes. Oh, yeah. Just avoid, yeah. pointedly avoid talking about 9-11. In every possible tortured way. Yeah, that was, was some they thought that was funny. Huh? Yeah, there was some unintentional 9/11 humor in the New Yorker just uh, the week after uh, the event uh, when um, uh, our friend Adam Gottnick actually wrote a uh, uh, was trying to sort of deal oh, with yes, it language, right, right, and he right. said. And the the odor in the air after the, it's it's like smoked mozzarella, and he was really taken to task. I didn't mean it was you know cr cringing for him, but yeah. uh, and. 
like smoked mozzarella without the mozzarella. That, uh, they don't, and, and, and John Updike wrote, uh, wrote uh, tried to deal with it. He happened to be in Brooklyn. He had seen the towers come down. And, and yeah. Updike, as, as he was wont to do, wrote about it in this sort of beautiful prose. Yeah, right. And this is completely the inappropriate. The beauty yeah, of a yeah. building collapsing. It takes right. the uh, attention away from the event yeah. and, and calls it to this sort of right. exquisite sentences. But, uh, I haven't seen uh, too many Madoff jokes. I mean, he was here, Madoff. And then, and then, and then on 60 Minutes, the segment that they recorded, he said, you really have nothing to worry about because the securities industry is so well regulated. That's that's his opinion. <laughs> Your task is to start the. Thanks to Guy. And, I have, and he's been trying to get me to be angry about this. I'm having a lot of trouble getting angry, and, I, and I'm running into real trouble making jokes about this whole thing. Because usually I make jokes. If someone like me, I make there's no limits on what can be right. working. But this, I haven't seen a lot of. I, oh, and I kept and every night on Letterman, about. there are five jokes about Madoff. Yeah. 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 That's unbelievable. You can't keep like up with it. I try to write humor about Madoff, but I'm I'm over taken by events over and over again. You can't keep up with it. Yeah. It's just, uh, I think the Cohn brothers have to do the movie. That's my... Yeah. Yeah. You have to have the grotesquerie. You have to have the right. grotesquerie. Of it. You know, the first cartoon I saw in the New Yorker that was funny after 9-11 was, I mean, it was sort of the, the gentle thing you're talking about, where uh, some kind of buffoonish guy comes in with a overly plaid jacket, and a woman looks up and says, I thought I'd never laugh again, and then I saw your jacket. And I mean, that, that, was, that had the nice, it was, it was gentle enough that it worked, and it was, and it... Well, they ran it, a cover with Barry Blitz cover of Bin Laden on a, on a Segway scooter oh, yes. going through uh -huh, the mountains. Yeah, right, right. But, yeah, uh, my favorite was the, the one that, the, the first... The, the death of irony thing that that made me psychotic. <laughs> oh, Greg Carter said that. Yeah. Greg, he Perry already said quickly. later. Yeah, he's yeah. yeah. quoted the death of irony. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I said, you know, that's your, uh, the death of irony. And I said, in a country that if you ask ninety percent of the American people what irony is, they couldn't give you a definition. I said, it's already dead here, you fucker. <laughs> it's, it's really unbelievable. It was extraordinary. But was, I thought was. The strange thing was, uh, and, I, it, and it was when I came back to the day, because I went out and performed, and I felt that, the, the, like you said about the New Yorker, the American people were way ahead of, the, of, the, of, of, of all of the talk show hosts. And yeah. the, the, the the, I, I, I said to John, I said, just go to a comedy club tonight. Um, and because and, 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 you're, you're behind, they want, they want it. And you better get it started. Yeah. Because yeah. it's... Uh, because it's necessary. Yeah, it's, it's true and, today. And I, think, think? and I think, and I, and this may be too much, but I think, um, in part, the, the lack of that kind of quick reaction in terms of humor um, created a situation which, uh, in which, our response to that of, of what happened of, of a heinous day, that our response to it was really psychotic. That we responded to 9/11. We go. We end up going to. I believe that you can't tie the war to Iraq to a sense of humor. But if I had some time, and maybe maybe if I keep you in a sweat box for three days, you'd understand what I'm trying to tell you. Um, that, uh, but that something there. That the fact that we didn't step away ever. That we literally responded with a hammer afterwards. And I think that's true. I think that's what humor does. Humor allows you to step away. And and we didn't step away. And it took us a long time. And, the, and when John finally spoke, he spoke from the heart about it, and that's really good. But no, but I'm, and, I, and, I, and I love John, and I think what he said was great. But, you know, I need the funny from you. Uh, that's when he asked if... And, and because, and, 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 the, and there has been... Again, yeah. And not yet was the idea. And there, and there has been built around... Uh, it was... The, it, because of the last eight years, the, it, what happened there was is very important and has to be remembered. But the, they're not the most important people who ever died. These, I mean, I, if I, my brother died a year before 9/11, and I, all I thought was, and he worked down in that district, and I was, I was just uh, thrilled in this. I mean, thrilled. I mean, I was. It was that, that he didn't die then, because to have them every day. Every day for the rest of your life, bring it up. Every day, it's mentioned. It's put in your face. Now, I, and I just thought that's a hell. It's hellish, and 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 and, and crazy. But I, I really think that uh, I really think our response to that whole event was was was. Uh, I found it odd. I found it really odd, and I think we responded like chickens with our heads cut off. And I think it starts with the leader on down. And, uh, I would and it was hard to say anything about that then, and then in this 
<laughs> recent campaign season. Oh, I was hoping a train was coming Jesus. through. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to pick me up and take me out of here. <laughs> you have to stay here for another 35 minutes, in fact. Uh, the, um, I, mean, I was saying that in the recent campaign season, probably the best line was Joe Biden's about Giuliani. Uh, how does he make a sentence, a noun, a verb in 9-11? And, and that, you can, that's, a, that's, a decent, that's a decent political joke, and you, you, you can make that in 2008, but certainly not in 2001 or two or maybe even three. Um, you know, we're, we're to, in about seven minutes, maybe, I think, break for questions, and I... I, you know, 19 pages. Um, so let, let me, I feel some obligation to, to return to the description of this panel and ask something that at least connects back to um, the end quote, W.C. Fields' observation, I never saw anything funny that wasn't terrible. Um, and and this, might, this is kind of a long and unwieldy question, but um, I, I was listening to the NPR show, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, a couple weeks ago, and they do their next week's headlines at the end. And um, the first one was from Roxanne Robinson. Uh, the headline would be, Bill Clinton tries to sign up for The Bachelor and is surprised to learn that being married makes him ineligible. And I got, a, I got an okay laugh. And, um, and then Mo Rocca got the next one, and he said uh, the headline was, All 14 members of Amazing Race fall into quicksand and die. And that gets, a, not here, but that gets a bigger laugh uh, in, the, in the studio audience and I thought that was interesting that you know where do you, you go to you go to sex and you go to death and you even in that order which is the way they naturally occur and um, you know these are the things we worry about most and uh, also the things that generally get the biggest laughs um, Mel Brooks said tragedy is when I cut my finger comedy is when you fall into an open sewer and die um, <laughs> The um, I, I saw I was in an Albany airport a couple weeks ago, and a kid had a T-shirt that said, uh, um, "It's only funny till someone gets hurt, then it's freaking hilarious." Yeah. <laughs> and you know, the, the, there was a Spinoza panel here uh, some time ago, and I read in, in Jim's book uh, that Spinoza laughed out loud only when watching his favorite spectacle, that of two spiders fighting to the death. Uh, and you know, this, this, this idea of this uh, wow. the, the morbidity somehow, uh, you know, triggers laughter. Um, in uh, John Morrell wrote a book called Taking Laughter Seriously, and he says even in Voltaire's day it was common for the rich to amuse themselves by taking a coach to an insane asylum to taunt the inmates. Um, out, out, yeah, Al Cap wrote a wrote a piece on a uh, fantastic piece on Charlie Chaplin. He says in that all comedy is based on man's delight in man's inhumanity to man, uh, and that we laugh at the trap at Chaplin because we know how futile it all is. We know how sick he feels inside, how terrified he is, how hopeless he is, and so naturally we feel great. Um, <laughs> And I'm curious about that. I mean, this goes a little bit. We probably don't have time for it, but to the again, these theories of laughter. One of which is superiority. We laugh out of some kind of feeling of sudden glory, some imminence within us that somebody else falls, we rise. The you know the disproportion the disproportion is in our favor. And uh, ha ha, you're on the floor. I'm not. Um, you know, and that, that's you know, that's one of the one of the traditional theories. Um, and I I thought you know I'd love to hear people's ideas about uh, connections between comedy and pain. We've, we've already touched on it to some extent. And if we, if, Jim, if you want to get into any of the... Yeah, let me yeah, it make might be, it boring and scientific. Better you than me. The best, you know, the, best, the best theory I know of of laughter is, is, is now called the false alarm theory. And the idea is that um, imagine our primate ancestors uh, uh, roving through the jungles of uh, Africa. And uh, there's a, a sort of rustling in the, in the bush, and, and, and everyone tenses up. It might be a, a, a rival gang, and we might have to fight or flee. And so there's this tense moment. And then someone realize, one of the members realizes, no, it's just a monkey. It's just a bunch of monkeys. It's no threat at all. And, and emits this stereotype vocalization that is laughter, which is, can, conveys the fact that what seemed to be something dangerous and something menacing is actually trivial and nothing at all. And it conveys this fact, and it's contagious. So the laughter spreads through the group. And everyone knows that the, 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 the seeming threat is not a threat. So the, I mean, the idea is that when, when something is weird or threatening or menacing, and suddenly, through some twist, it dissolves into, into trivial nothingness, that's when we, when we laugh. And you can also uh, you, know, you, you see you know, sort of a, a, another possible origin of laughter just in the uh, 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 rough and tumble play among chimpanzees. They, they emit this sort of 
panting, breathy. It's really laughter. It's twice as, uh, with twice the frequency of our laughter. We go, ha, 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 ha. We laugh when we exhale. And they go, ha, 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 ha. So they, it's, a, it's laughter when you're exhaling and inhaling. And they do it when they're doing sex play, when they're doing rough and tumble playing. They love to tickle one another. And so tickling is a kind of, it's like aggression, but it's, it's playful aggression. So it's something that seems dangerous, but you laugh because it's really nothing at all. And so, you know, the, the, the fact that we so much of our, our humor is about sex and death is perfectly obvious on this, on this uh, uh, theory. We laugh even at things that are genuinely menacing. I mean, nothing to me is more terrifying than, than, than death and being annihilated. Uh, and, and by making jokes about it, we, we at least pretend that it's, it's trivial and nothing to worry about. And, and sometimes, you know, the, the uh, making a, a sport, making jokes about something trivializes what deserves to be trivialized, uh, it, you know, like the uh, idea that the Jews are guilty of killing God. And sometimes we trivialize something that's really threatening, or the Holocaust humor is an example of that. Uh, so this is, the, this is the boring, pedantic, theoretical input that I was supposed to bring, so I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> You've all been edified. But you're right. I, mean, right. I, I turned 42 last month, and my mom said, well, you're about halfway done. <laughs> that, was, that was the one thing I remember from that day. It was, I don't think she meant it to be funny, but I thought it was very funny. <laughs> Other thoughts? I think, I think putting people down is, in humor is a great way to get back. It's kind of a an evening of the scales. Remember, remember Billy Martin, that horrible manager of the Yankees? Mm -hmm. Some sports writer once had the perfect description. He's a mouse studying to be a rat. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. <laughs> and they always, you know, remember during World War II, that's how old I am again. The, 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 in, in your Fuhrer's face, all the jokes about Hitler and, and Goebbels and all those guys. That was just a, you know, the simplest form of patriotism. Mm -hmm. Just. You know, trying to bring them down. Always tells the same. He's told me this joke a number of times. He doesn't remember it. He's told. He's, he's a, 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 a a client, you know, of the of the butchers walks into the butcher shop and he says, uh, um, the butcher says, "How are you?" And and and, and the client says, "Well, it's, it's not very well. I just lost most of my money." And, and, it's, and the butcher says, "So what else is what else has happened?" Well, he says, "My wife has cancer." He says, well, "What? Isn't that?" Isn't, he says, "He says, but what else has happened?" He says, "Isn't that good enough?" The butcher says, "It could have happened to me." <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that's, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's the Will Rogers, right? Everything is funny if it's happening to somebody else. When yeah. you talk to the, uh, <coughs> when I've gone to see the um, the troops in uh, in uh, either Walter Reed or Bethesda Naval or in, uh, you know, in in, in, our, in in the guys even in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, the. The common thread is that uh, it is that they're the ones. If you're talking to somebody, I mean, you go in and you're looking at somebody who's lost limbs and stuff, and it's like you're standing there, and I mean, sir, you just really kind of go into a shock mode, and they immediately they immediately go to the joke about it. They just and then and they talk and they want to talk about it, and they want to talk about what was funny about it. Yeah. And it was, you know, it's it, it's incredible, but it just and I. And it's that thing again of getting distance, I think. Um, I'm always shocked when people send me uh, things where they, uh, you know, they, they've got either somebody was sick in the family, there's somebody, they brought somebody who's sick in the family, and the amount of times humor is used in terms of illness, and or people on chemo listening to, to comedy stuff, and, uh, and, and as someone who really loves humor, I don't, I get these things and I, I don't get it. I mean, I, I don't. I don't know if anything could be that, I'm, you know, that f I mean, but that it works on that level. And maybe, you know, maybe I had to start stockpiling shit that really makes me laugh because uh, I, don't, I don't, I'm always kind of shocked when that, when you get that, when you get that kind of response. But it really seems, but it's that thing that allows you to step back from it. I think that's why, it, you know, you know, it's like that, at funerals, they often tell somebody speaks and says funny things about the guy who's died. Yes. About yeah. them. Yeah. Mm. Sure. Francis, you mentioned Bergson earlier, and he talks about... Uh, you know, let's just 
necessity. Yeah, and, and the anesthesia of the heart that, that, that's necessary in some ways. Uh, if you sympathize with everything, nothing's funny because you're, you're too busy. <laughs> you know, the, that, that, that response takes over. So you, it, is, it is that distance, I think, uh, to some extent anyway. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about the time. We're, we're supposed to begin questions uh, from the audience at 4 o'clock. So I, just, I just have to say one thing. Oh. I just hate it when people say that's not, that's not very funny. They're very imperious. You, know, you, oh. make these, you have to make these grotesque jokes and the people that you get put, you know, that's not funny, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's very funny with <laughs> Does that. Does it happen a lot? <laughs> yeah, it happens a lot to me, actually. I like a butcher joke. Um, so we're going to invite the audience now to uh, step up. I'm going to put these 19 pages away. And um, we have two mics. Yeah, so. You can hand that out later. I'd like to read 19 pages. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll email it to you. Yeah. Come on. Uh, this is a general question about the. Could you say who you are? Just to... oh, um, Robert Arroyo. I'm a mortgage-backed security attorney. That's a good joke, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be at least a year ago. But, are, you, are you really a mortgage? I, yeah, I used to. Yeah, work. <laughs> clients Merrill Lynch, Fannie Mae, friends of mine. Uh, no longer friends. Anyway, about delivery, like the method of uh, communicating the comedy, whether it's in print, visual. Uh, I mean, for comics. I think how you say something is just as funny as what you say. So can you speak on that issue? More so, I guess, right? I mean, is it, when do you say timing and delivery are more important than subject material? I mean, I don't want to speak for you, but as performers? <laughs> <laughs> you say something. He's the one who could do it. Don't yeah. let me say it. <laughs> yeah. Every time he says fuck, it's with a new nuance. Oh, right. <laughs> Um, I I'll, I'll try. Uh, uh, delivery is 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 key. Uh, there's a uh, working in TV. There's um, there's it's it's a uh, it's really been an education on how many different ways a joke can fail. Something can be funny in your head and not on paper. Something can be funny on paper, not read out loud. Something can be funny read out loud and not performed. Something can be funny performed and not on TV. And uh, it's... Well, can you give an well. example? Yeah. Of well, I mean, the thing is, if it's not funny at one stage, it'll end there. But mm -hmm. you can get to all those stages yeah. and, and then still have, a, have it not be funny. It's, it's really humbling. Yeah, I'm so used to that comedy you see made sometimes. So someone must have found it funny at one point, but then when it gets into the theater. Well, well and, and I think yeah. there's also, you, you, you were even talking about uh, the, the tragedy of compromise. There's also that uh, what you're talking right. about. Uh, but uh, there's also that part, too, with, uh, with TV and film, where something can be, uh, so many notes are taken. Uh, I just heard this story about the screenplay of, um, Oh shoot! Where does Robin Hood take place? Was it sure? Sure. sure. Forest, uh -huh. So I, I think this was. Uh, thank you. Uh, this that was is, phenomenal. Yeah. This is, <laughs> this is the crowd. Wow. We've met yeah. them before. Yeah. Really? Right there. They were really. That, that's the most excited they've been the whole time. <laughs> So now, now we go to all our Robin Hood uh, uh, jokes. Yeah. Here. And what county was it in? <laughs> oh, he <laughs> Nottingham. Oh, yeah. Sheriff, so, Sheriff you know what? And I actually think that's the name of the uh, movie is Nottingham. Oh. And uh, this guy, the screenplay writer, uh, wrote a movie from the point of view of the sheriff of Nottingham, mm -hmm. and which is a great idea of this, you know, having to deal with this Robin Hood. Who's it's a, it's a wonderful idea, and apparently it is. And then Russell Crowe signed on to play the sheriff. Great, and now. Uh, and you can just see by the end product what horrible oh, yeah. things have happened along the way of this wonderful idea. This movie star is on to get it done. It has now become, you can see that it was like, couldn't it be more likable? Couldn't it be this? And now it is now just being called Robin Hood, and it's Russell Crowe playing Robin Hood. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that is, and that is uh, part, of the, part of the tragedies of happening. Have you ever seen a film called Gone Fishing? Have you ever seen a film? Did you ever see, it, was, it was one of the most horrible comedies I've ever seen. It just, it, there wasn't. I couldn't understand how the, a Hollywood film could even have not one. I mean, people agreed. It was just, was Matthew that, Broderick in that? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. It was, it was in the early '80s, I think. It just stuck in my mind as being wonderfully horrible. I don't know how humor can ever be collaborative with a bunch of people sitting around. I worked at Saturday Night Live a mercifully brief time because I couldn't stand the, the communal bullshit. I mean, you sit alone in a room and 
be funny. Everybody knows that, right? <laughs> you don't. You don't. At, but at the same time, 30 is the most, um, is the most communal place I've ever. It's, it's got such a distinct vision from Tina, uh, Faye, and Robert Carlock. It's, it's so singularly their vision, and yet I've never been in a room, worked on a script so communally before where it's, you know, every joke is punched up with a, a room of people. Yeah. Yeah. Still yeah. as good as Larry David. What's that? Still not as good as Larry David. He does it all. <laughs> but Larry David with Curb Your Enthusiasm, I mean, that is his ideas and stuff, but that is improv. I mean, yeah, I, I, part of it is also my improv background is I'm, I'm used to, yeah, part of me thinks there is. You'll never change my mind. No, all right. <laughs> I found it. I, I, found, I, I had a, was in the writer's room for the first time, and I, I, I had a complete meltdown. Yeah. I scared them. I, I, I thought it was insane. Well, because, Larry David never had anything produced. He was at Saturday Night Live, right? Yeah. He never, he never could break the. But he had a writer's show. room at Seinfeld. Mm. Yeah. You know, so I, I think it also depends on the room that you've got going and the person who's running the room. But a room can kill something, and a room sure. can, can make something but in the, thrive. But in the end, the, uh, the also you got to realize the reason that uh, you know there's a tendency for time in the business to shit to rise to the top is the people who there is the people who end up in charge of television and film. They're they they don't go. They, I don't know how they get there. I mean, seriously, they don't go to a school. None of them really. They're not funny. They don't know what it is. Even the people in charge who were just talking about Comedy Central. I mean, half the people I deal with there have. I'm, I'm like, can't you go to like House and Garden? I mean, that's what you know. um, yeah, really. It's, so it's it's there. There's really a part of it. They, you know. We have another question here. Yeah. Um, so my so question you? is about the who number. Are you? Uh, oh, my name's Sue. Hi. <laughs> uh, um, it's like a really aggressive AA. <laughs> 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 um, so my question. I know earlier we talked about numbers and how some numbers are funny. And um, so I've done improv before. And when you do improv, they teach you about the rule of threes and how if you're going to set up a joke, it's important to hit it three times. If you hit it more than three times, it might not be as funny. When you do it the first time, you're starting to set the pattern. When you do it the second time, the audience is starting to pick up on it, but it's not until the third time that it's really funny. But the thing that they also seemed to say from this was that they didn't know why three was funny. It was almost like something that they discovered that already was sort of in us as people. So I just wanted to hear what you thought about the rule of threes in comedy. Uh, yeah, I, th I think there is something intuitive uh, about the, the rule of three, is that th there is something that you intuitively recognize. Uh, and uh, But then you watch something like The Simpsons, and they'll do something like, they'll do seven, or they'll do two. Like, there's also pushing against that sort of intuitive. Uh, my background in math, um, when I was really, uh, really into it, and really sort of deep in the um, Thinking deeply of simple things was the quote that I loved. But it, it didn't feel like you were coming up with it on your own. It felt like you were exploring you know, another planet, as it were, a math planet. And, uh, and I think w uh, with improv, when you, when you hit on something that feels really true, um, it feels the same way. And there's something about three. It, when you go back, I don't know if it necessarily helps you to get there by thinking of, let's do it three times. but. It, it chimes with something that's true. And isn't there the idea that, that it's not funny at four, five, six, and it becomes funny again at seven? Yeah, there is that, too. <laughs> there is that, too. I, and there's also the thing of and the third time, it, it, you can't just keep repeating exactly the same thing. Then on the third time, you twist it or you heighten it. Um, yeah. Well, Monty Python was the master of the beating the dead horse mm -hmm. school of comedy. Because it wasn't funny, it wasn't fun. Then all of a sudden, it becomes hysterical after a while. We have another question. Well, I have two quick points, uh, ah, just comments. So we they may even be humorous. I'll let you decide that. I want to reclaim some language from my fellow atheists. The ideology of the word God is good. So I think if an atheist says during a sex act, Oh, God. <laughs> I'm reclaiming the word. <laughs> the other thing uh, for you, sir, regarding is there such a thing as an immoral joke? 
Uh, not too, well, a, a year or two ago. A funny immoral joke. I mean, uh, uh, yes, a funny immoral joke. Is there a joke that's oh. whose immorality, okay. whose Im apparent okay. immorality is not uh, more than that. compensated for by, by its uh, This will fit, sheer okay. Uh, you tell me, please. Uh, I heard Joan Rivers in a routine not too long ago. Um, I don't remember the joke, but I think I have the punchline reasonably well uh, said. Um, she said, uh, well, but my, whatever the joke was, ta-da, ta-da, well, my people uh, know full well how to, uh, my people, uh, my, my people know how to walk into ovens. Know how to what? Walk into, walk into ovens. ovens. Um, I've never felt the same about Joan Rivers since then, so I'd appreciate a comment or two on what's, that. What was the setup for that joke? I don't remember. I mean, well, it was a joke. It was a joke about ov uh, ovens or cooking. I, I, I wish. It started with the Pillsbury joke. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Setup was. Yeah, the, uh, uh, yeah. No. Sorry. I don't know if you don't know what the setup is. It's tough. Oh, all right. We have another question coming up. Ira, come on over. Hello. Um, I was a sports writer for a long time. So What's your name? Ira Burko. <laughs> I know your name. And. Uh, <laughs> um, it's uh, humor often is a matter of context, and uh, you're talking about 9/11, and you know, could you be funny at 9/11? And I was thinking, could you be funny at Kennedy? You know, and probably not. That it's a matter of time, but a matter of context. In baseball dugouts and locker rooms, almost anything went. And uh, I remember uh, in spring training uh, a number of years ago, and I'll mention the names because I don't think they would care that I mentioned their names. But um, it's all a matter of context. And I was behind the batting cage in Alling Field in uh, St. Petersburg. And the Mets were going to be playing the Pirates in a spring training game. Well, Lee Mazzilli, who was an outfielder for the Mets, was standing behind the cage. And the Pittsburgh team coming up from Bradenton got off the team bus and walked over. And uh, Bill Madlock was a third baseman for the Pirates. And uh, Mazzilli had been with the Pirates. And so they'd been teammates, and they were friends. So uh, Mazzilli walks, uh, uh, Madlock walks over and shakes hands with uh, Mazzilli and said, uh, Lee, it's uh, good to see you. Well, it's good to see you, uh, uh, Bill. And then Madlock says, um, we're going to be here overnight. Uh, do you have any women I could sleep with tonight? <coughs> and uh, do you know any women I could sleep with tonight? And Mazzilli says, no, well, I'm just here with my wife. You can sleep with my wife. <laughs> and Madlock said, no, thanks. I had her last time. <laughs> uh, so it's all a matter of context. And, uh, uh, and finally, the, ver the very first time I was ever in a, in a baseball locker room was the old Los Angeles Angels. And they were, I was in Minnesota, and they were, play they were gonna playing the Minnesota Twins. And it was a strange team. They had this uh, little short Albie Pearson. They had Dean Chance, Bo Belinsky. Uh, characters. They had Jimmy Pearsall. They also had Lou Burdett, who was an old uh, pitcher. And so I'm in the locker room, and somehow or other, Jimmy Pearsall was on a tricycle. Somehow a tricycle got into the locker room, and he was pedaling around. Now, some of you may not remember the Fair Strikes Out, uh, the story of Jimmy Pearsall, starring Anthony Perkins, which was a big film in the 50s, in which Jimmy Pearsall literally went crazy and was put into a mental institution. But he came out of the mental institution, and he's playing outfield for the Los Angeles Angels now. And he's on a tricycle, and he's going along with the tricycle. And Lou Burdett looks at him and says, get off that tricycle, you crazy son of a bitch. Now, Jimmy Pearsall was certifiably crazy. You know? and, and some of the other players just sort of snickered and stuff. So, and, and Jimmy Pearsall wasn't insulted. And that's... Uh, my, uh, my uh, definition of, of humor often is context. I, I, I heard a really funny, uh, I thought it was hilarious, but uh, it was a, at a writer's room. And uh, one of the writers was uh, really horribly complicated relationship with his father, alienated from him, hadn't spoken to him in his years. And his father committed suicide. And the writer came in that day and said, you know, my dad committed suicide. And, and, da, da, da. and one of the actors, but he's here, but, you know, 
Uh, and uh, an actress for that show didn't show up that day because her dog had died. And the writer was furious and saying, my fucking dad died and I'm, and I'm here. And, and uh, a junior writer said, well, in all fairness, she wasn't alienated from her dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's Matt Hubbard said that, and uh, that I think that is brilliant. And what made that joke great and okay is is the guy whose dad died laughed. You know what I mean? And that is definitely. And I've I've been at a wedding and I gave a toast. I mean, there are definitely times where a joke can go either way. And part yeah. of the context is so important. And, and part of the context is the audience, and whether the audience is going to give you that that is going to give it to you. Yeah. But they're often waiting at memorial services and things like that for somebody to say something funny because it releases yeah. a yeah. huge amount of tension to grief. I remember a good friend of mine, his wife were killed uh, near Al in Albania, delivering stuff to the Kosovo refugees. And they, their car went rolled down a mountain and they were both killed. And at the, at the memorial service, a woman stood up and said, well, Penny would really like this because now she could tell you, guess what? I died in Albania. <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't know Penny, but it was I, I was at a wedding, and uh, the groom's uh, father had uh, committed suicide. There's a lot of suicide, but uh, in, when he was in high school, and so there was like three men in a row gave toasts who had been his lifelong friends, and nobody was saying it outright what had happened, but it was just everything was, and all the guys are crying, and it, it was just incredibly moving. And my uh, friend, who was the best man, said, can we have a lighthearted toast? And I wasn't even thinking, and I just went up there, and I said, don't worry, I'm not gonna cry. I'm not one of Shane's pussy friends. <laughs> and as I said it, I looked out, and I realized I know four people at this wedding, and and all the grandparents and the aunts and uncles. And there was that pause where you don't know if they're going to give it to you. And then literally it felt like waves of people saying, pussy, pussy, pussy. <laughs> and, and it was OK. But I've definitely been places where I've said stuff that is not OK. And it, 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 it can be cruel. Can we have another question? Yeah. Um, I'm David Galef. Um, I've actually reviewed. Jim's book, uh, and I've appeared in Light before, um, John Mello, the editor. Mm -hmm. But what I'm interested in asking is, what do you make of humor um, that sort of has a moral center and then sort of topples it? It's the kielbasa joke, you know? Uh, a guy walks into a store and asks for a pound of kielbasa, and the guy behind the counter says, are you a Polak? I can tell this because I'm Polish. Um, <laughs> and the guy says, well, yeah, I am, but what kind of, what kind of language is that to use? I mean, if I walked in here and, and asked for a pound of filter fish, would you say, are you a yid? If I walked in here and asked for some chow mein, would you say, are you a chink? And the guy spreads his hands and says, well, you're right, but this is a hardware store. <laughs> uh, and on, on, the, on the one hand, it's clearly, I mean, the guy... <laughs> The guy is protesting ethnic slurs. He's saying you shouldn't say that. On the other hand, it's a Polish joke. Yeah. And no, I'm not going to tell any more, but I got a bunch of them. And they're, they're, they're offensive, and yet, you know, clearly they're against that. It's mathematically beautiful, though, too. It's a little bit of a Mobius yeah. strip where yeah. you, just, you don't know what side of it you're on. It's great. <laughs> No other comments, or? <laughs> it was a perfect anecdote. It's, yeah. it's self-explaining. That's okay. cool, yeah. Thanks. Beautiful. <laughs> another, quote, another question coming up. I mean, my name is Barry. I'd like to, uh, Carl Jung and Freud both said, remember, why did, you know, how did you figure out what you wanted to do when you grew up? Both of them said, remember what you loved to do as a kid, start doing it again as an adult. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you might share on a personal point, what might you have loved or something special when you were a kid that kind of was that moment you realized that you had a love for comedy and it's something you wanted to do? I'm just, would love to hear that. <laughs> I was brought to Second City as a kid uh, when I was way too young to be there. Uh, and, and my parents would always get us to sit in the very front because it, 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 my mom with her thick Israeli accent would say, I'm very hard of hearing. And, and they would say, oh, so you, you're okay. And so they would sit us right up front. And uh, <laughs> in the outro, um, they would talk. They, they used to have a kid show in the 80s, and they would call it Sunday, Sunday, Little Bastards, Fun Day, and, and, and look at me. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and I didn't under, but uh, that for me was definitely like, oh, I, I love this. But at, at the same time, I, I used to really love math. But, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but the, I think that for me was a formative thing. Yeah, yeah. my parents had these uh, records. Of, uh, there used to be a, a show in New York, uh, the upstairs at the downstairs, uh, 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 Julius Monk. And uh, a lot of the guys who, Ronnie Graham, there's all these great writers came out of it. And, uh, uh, and, um, and they, and they, and I got, I started listening to those and I just, I couldn't, and I just found them really funny and I just was kind of fascinated by that. But I really ended up coming at it from, the, I mean, I ended up doing this. I was always fascinated with comedy, but I was really more interested in theater. And, uh, but comedy always, I mean, I watched every, every comic. I, I watched Ed Sullivan for the comics. <laughs> you know, and I just, I was always, and I started collecting albums. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, it was, just, uh, you know, and it was, it didn't matter. Jonathan Winters, Newhart, it, you know, Myron Cohen, I didn't give a shit. They were all like, I just found the whole thing fascinating. <clears throat> to stand in front, I mean, it just made no sense. One person stands up, is going to tell Joe, the whole thing is idiotic. <laughs> and I just found it amazing. So, I, I mean, that was really the hook for me. And when I, and the thing that's really fascinating about it is that whole thing, because hundreds of people come up in, you know, in the course of my lifetime. You know, I could do what you do. And then you just go, you, okay. Uh, yeah, you could do it. Uh, but the, the thing that is interesting about it is, is that it's the, the only difference, the, the real difference between, uh, is that, uh, you know, you sit around a table like this, let's say, let, and then let's say there was a stage there. And you can be funny sitting at this table, but you walk the five feet and you get up on the stage and you're not funny anymore. Yeah. And it's a totally different type of a craft. Yeah. And it took me over, uh, over 15 years to figure out the five feet. It's three years of foot. You made a math joke. That sounds like another illustration of the horrible uh, Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hour rule. That, you know, anything, you know, something yeah, yeah. like crummy, like I do a lot of book reviewing. Uh, you, 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 Anybody who's intelligent ought to be able to do it. I had to do it for about 10,000 hours before I got to be any good at it. Yeah. And, and, and pianists have to play for about 10,000, 10, et cetera, et cetera. And, yeah. and uh, I, Malcolm Gladwell, in his book, uh, Outliers, I hate to uh, draw any more attention to him, but he shows how robust <laughs> this, this figure is, this 10,000 hour. And, um, and it, it might be, I mean, it's doing it for 10,000 hours that suddenly you, I mean, you it wasn't sort of a reasoned progress over yeah. that five feet. It's just something your rhythms got better, or your your I mean, your timing got better in ways I that are impossible more to. On stage but you've got tremendous self confidence, it seems to me. Although when you were sitting in the back room, you looked like like a wounded neurotic child. But that was because you'd have cigarettes. But what, what, what yeah, strikes me about you? Is, I, I don't really yeah. like the you know. I mean, really, the, I mean, it, it, the reason I was a wounded neurotic child in there is just like I don't really like. I don't know any of you. <laughs> <laughs> You, you know what I said was, I don't really like any of yeah. <laughs> You know, but I don't. I'm kind of in this room, and we're in a tiny room, and it's kind of claustrophobic, and it was like, what am I, I was like, should I ask for an autograph? You know? <laughs> um, we're hoping we'll draw together, though. For yeah. <laughs> richer, deeper relationship. Yeah. I was looking for a larger room. Is <laughs> uh, what I was looking for. Yeah. But, and uh, the chewing created space. Um, I think, I think W.C. Fields was a good example of what I think is true about humor. Most, most humorists that I know, including myself, are depressed, angry, mis isolated people. When I was a little kid, I, all I knew how to do was draw and write. I did that because my home environment was toxic. I was trapped in a little apartment with six kids, one drunken parent and one absentee tyrant parent. And I tunneled out through my imagination. That was the only thing I knew how to do. It was self-therapy. I'm sure a hundred other guys could say the same thing. And it became second nature, it became what I did, it became my mindset. And I don't know how to do anything else. I really don't. I, never, I just never acquired any other skills. Oh. I'd work in a hardware store if I didn't do this. 
It was <laughs> totally determined when I, I don't think of that anymore. I don't have to because it's automatic. But you were a, you but, were a great man on uh, ad man on Madison Avenue for a while, yeah, that was, and that I mean that seems to me to require some of the you know the same sort of ge genius. I mean you've got to take. You know. You've got to, in, in Even just more a few words, you've got to make them sort of droll and memorable and, and, and something that will convince people to buy a stupid product that they don't need. And that, to me, I mean, that, that requires a kind of comic genius. Uh, no? It requires a, a certain uh, mimic ability, I think, okay. is what I, I, I have. Uh, we have a question. Yeah. Uh, first, an observation. Um, I notice that almost every time you have come to the point of talking about what you mean by humor, you were talking about the absurd. And when it's not funny, it's because it's tragic. In the very same instance, that's what I hear. And none of you have made that reference. Nobody has word, mentioned the word absurdity with respect to humor. And I think that's where the humor is. Um, the tragic is someplace else. If we were to talk about Richardson today from her recent events, we would not be talking about humor. We'd be talking about unspeakable Tragedy. That's the first point. Um, the other point I want to make to you is, I'm having a problem with my leg again. Oh. Sorry. So let me just hold this. Sure, uh, the problem is, it seems to me, that in the culture, it's the men who are funny and the women who are not. Now, why are the men funny? Men, not you folks, your professionals. But the men are funny because they want the women. Or at least it used to be that way. Uh, for the most part. It doesn't work that way. Well, <laughs> we'll go talk. That's the case. No. No. What is it? No. Humor does not. It's not the key. You need a few other things. That's funny. <laughs> but I'm making the point that men use humor to melt women who say, gee, honey, I just met a very interesting guy. He's funny. I never hear a man say, I just met a very interesting woman. She's funny. She's not funny. <laughs> She's sexy, but she isn't funny. He's funny, and he's more acceptable. That's the way he makes his way in the world. So if you want to talk about absurdity versus tragedy, you can talk about it from that point of view. I wonder if that doesn't stimulate one or two things more in, in all of you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll try to limp back to the answer. The reason we didn't discuss absurdity is because we knew you would come up and say it. <laughs> um, and I'm glad you did. Uh, let that go. <laughs> You'll have to. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 I find it, I, I mean, I find it, I find it attractive in women if they're funny. I mean, yeah, you know, too. it's, you know, God, you hope so. Yeah. It makes for a long fucking night otherwise. <laughs> you were talking about Hitchens before, and I that he wrote this article, Why Women Aren't oh, Funny. Yeah. Right. And if a woman is funny, it's because she's either a, a bull dyke, a Jew or a uh, or butch and trying to be a man. Right. <laughs> so the, the the thesis is protected from counterexamples. Uh, Tina Fey is you? none of those things. <laughs> right, yeah. So I, I don't. Neither is Amy Poehler. Uh, so I mean, there's just. I also just find I feel like he picks his topics out of a hat of what will get attention. Of well, God is dead. Uh, there, <laughs> women aren't funny. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, part yeah. of it just can't even. Hamas is right. And, yeah, yeah. I, I, I really feel that it's uh, coming from that. But if you do, I mean, if you just go out in the field and observe <laughs> joke telling behavior, the overwhelming majority of jokes and joke like utterances are made by men, and most of the laughter is done by women. There's a guy named Robert Provine, who's a psychologist at the University of Maryland, who's spent a lot of time eavesdropping in shopping malls and so forth. One of the things he discovered is most laughter is elicited by lines like, gotta go now, or must be nice, or it's like a really bad sitcom uh, scripted by a completely untalented writer. 
<laughs> but to the extent that you know, there is formulaic joke making, it's the men who are making all the jokes and the women who are doing all the laughing. So that's just a, an well, empirical th That's two different things. One is in the for sort of formulaic stuff that's not even really funny to anybody, and yet there's polite laughter. Yes, women are more polite than men and will give it up more than men. Absolutely. <laughs> then there's what's really funny, and I think there's a, a little bit of that, is that old Eddie Murphy, um, the, the thing on SNL when he put on white face oh, yeah. and went in and saw how white people acted when, when black people weren't around. And it was hilarious. It was, they were throwing money and having parties <laughs> and all this stuff. And I do think women are different when men aren't around and are allowed to be funnier and uh, it's a little bit what I was talking about before in terms of that air to breathe that something will be assumed that you're funny. And, and now that I'm professional at what I do, I, I feel like I'm given a leg up in terms of people assume or give me that, um, that, that, that take that leap of faith that what I say is going to be funny until I prove myself. And I, I feel like men have that more inherently just societally. It's like I, he's going to be funny. They get there faster. But well, I think it's. I think it's in part that the two that, that uh, it, it, it's you know it's just, it's somehow in the it, it, it would help a lot I think if humor, uh, uh, you know that someone's sense of humor. I think the sense of humor is a muscle, and uh, I think it's uh, it, the the fact that we don't uh, we teach it at all, or teach its use. Or teach you, you know to, to even it, it's to, it's ignored much like uh, like uh, you know math ignores the practicalities of math in high school. They ignore it's completely ignored as a and it's a muscle that if it were developed in school, that you wouldn't have this thing of men and women and how and how it comes to pass in the society. I know for a fact in terms of stand-up comics. Um, in order for a, a a woman to survive the the nonsense of going on the road, it's brutal. I mean, you've just got to be built. Uh, you've got to be built a totally different way to deal. Because it's, a comp it's not only it's it's just it, it it is a hard road to hoe there. It, it just in the nature of the fact that it really is. They're usually two guys. I mean, you, you would literally, especially when I was starting out, you you go into a comedy condo and it'd be two there'd be two guys and a woman who comes in and you're all living together in this kind of a setup, and it's it's just it's. It's it's a tough it's a tough it's it's a tough business for that type of thing to occur. Now it's kept coming along more and more now, but I think it's uh, I think that's one of the things that'll fall by the is falling by the wayside. But I do think teaching it would be huge. Hi. Uh, my name is Kate. Uh, I was talking to a friend the other day who's been studying neurobiology and neuroscience. And she was saying, uh, talking about the link between intelligence and humour, and she would, she was saying that she would rather be with a man that has a great sense of humour because it's a foregone conclusion that he would therefore be intelligent because they're so intrinsically linked, uh, rather than a man that's intelligent because then he might not necessarily be have a sense of humour. Um, so I was curious about what your your thoughts are about like intelligence and humour and whether you find that certain uh, people that you work with, you know, whether there are certain patterns that come out or differences? We all belong to Mensa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mensa was uh, defined as, a, as a gr uh, an organization for people who are extremely smart, but not smart enough not to join Mensa. <laughs> I mean, what, what was said seems intuitively right to me and that I think of somebody who is incredibly funny as being smart because they, they can you know, yoke things together that are improbable in the way that a, a great uh, a poet does, a maker of metaphors. And that's, you know, Aristotle calls that the mark of genius, to take dissimilar things and find what's similar there. And I think that, that kind of mental play that uh, a good comedian, I think almost by definition, has to have um, does presuppose a kind of intelligence. But the unfunniest man in the universe is Noam Chomsky. He's, uh, yeah, and it doesn't work both a ways. Real, except yeah. in a kind of Debbie Downer way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a great blurb on the back of his book. 
not smart, but in a Debbie yeah. Downer sort Isn't of Isn't this way. fun, but what about the genocide? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cody, we, had a, uh, we were going to have a uh, little surprise at the end here. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know we're a little bit over time. Let me, so uh, I should, let me give my very brief closing remark. Um, uh, W.H. Auden said, among those whom I like or admire, I can find no common denominator. But among those whom I love, I can. All of them make me laugh. And uh, by that uh, standard, I now love all of these panelists. And I'm so uh, grateful for uh, your generosity, with your time, with your jokes, with everything else. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And um, we're going to them down. information about our programs and a complete archive of past Philip Tatey's events is available at philiptatey.org. <laughs>